This is Rosen Island. What? That was I'm one of the winners of the publisher's clearing house. <laughs> Mad McMahon wants to see me. I have to apologize. I thought this was the Joe Franklin studio. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you why I'm here. I happen to be in town over doing some stuff for the NBC affiliate. That's right. And, you know, Ed McMahon, our good friend, could not be here. Yeah. But it seems, David, that you are the $1 million winner. Oh, my God! <laughs> I've won a million bucks! <laughs> Shout out to my people. This is Ed McMahon, rolling slow through the suburbs in an unmarked van. I ran the strip in the 80s, brought big fat checks to the ladies. When I showed up at their door, they would start screaming like crazy. Break it in hand over fist, was on the VIP list. I was a verbal gunslinger, and my shots never missed. But now the bills have come due, and my credit scores whacked. So I'm hitting up the winners to get my checks back. Hi, Ed McMahon. Ed McMahon. Remember, I gave you that big check. I'd like to have that check back. If you, I, I'm having some stuff would help a lot. Just a little bit. Because you know, and I knew, you know, the, the, the difference of the situation was, I knew you were making bank on those shirts. <laughs> You know, I knew you were bright. I did, I did okay. <laughs> yeah. You look like the Monopoly guy. <laughs> you're, you're, you're driving from town to town in a black top hat and a monocle. <laughs> <laughs> I remember they started bootlegging them just to quickly talk about me for a second. I'll never join you if you only knew the power of the dark side. That said, Luke, I am your father. I said to myself, I'm lying. How they're going to get a liar? He told you what happened to your father. He told me enough. He told me you killed him. No, I am your father. Say what? the baldest of them all. I see a red door and I want to paint it black. It's the city of heaven, the city of angels. Lonely is I am to be proud. All right, everyone. Welcome back to Dose of Reality again. You're probably sick of seeing me because this is the third time live today. But I am here with a guest today, Nathan Sanders. Thank you for joining me, buddy. And I think you're still muted. Hold on, guys. <laughs> Nathan, I can't hear you. While we wait for his mic, I hear him now. Nathan? Nathan? I can't hear you, bro. Hold on a second, guys. Let me try to add him up on the Facebook. Nathan, I can't hear you. Can't hear you. Are you muted? <clears throat> All right. Well, for those of you that are new to this, what this is, is it's the My Awakening series. What I like to do is I like to interview different researchers in the various communities 
and get their personal story and their journey, how they've come to uh, the conclusion they've come to, the topics they've looked at, and how it's affected them and whatnot. And today is Nathan's turn. Just give me a minute. I'm trying to figure out his audio issue. Really strange. It sounds like I almost hear him on the keyboard, but I can't hear his mic. Nathan, are you there? Brian, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry okay, about that. My, my volume had somehow turned down. Okay, no problem. So I just gave everybody an intro to the show. Thank you for joining me today. I appreciate you coming on such short notice. Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you for asking me. Yeah. So, I mean, we'll just get started. Um, you know, yeah, you I know what that. I wanted to... Yeah, go ahead. I wanted to uh, ask you about a certain Mandel effect I was just thinking about before we went on. Um, I don't hear it talked about a lot. Are you familiar with the alteration in the song, The Bear Necessities from the Jungle Book, the original Disney film? No. Is that not. one you've talked about? Okay, this, no. this one is really fascinating. And I think it's really important because it does a couple of things. It sends a message or it asks a question that I think is really important that I ask myself all the time. And it's also interesting for those who, who believe that Mandela effect is uh, alternating timelines or merging of different timelines that are happening simultaneously. Um, and what the change is, now the movie came out in 1967 and the line in the song that has changed, it used to be wherever I wonder, wherever I roam, I couldn't be fonder of my big home, okay? So now when you play the soundtrack album, even if you have the, you know, the, the actual soundtrack vinyl album has changed or, you know, the, the VHS tape or whatever, and you put it in, what he's singing now is, this is the bear singing, wherever I wonder, wherever I roam, I couldn't be found of my big home. So oh, wow. it no longer rhymes, Brian. Yeah, I haven't heard that one. Use our logic here. Me, that's a message. Wherever I wander, wherever I roam, I couldn't be found. And what I find with the Mandela effect that's, that I'm sure you've thought about this too, is how it has a blatant disregard for, I'd say, the, uh, the sacredness of our culture. <laughs> you know what I mean? It doesn't care what it changes and messes up. That's why I think so many of them are degraded in a way, you know, like the other version was better, you know, than what, what it is now. But I think that's missing the point. I think it's, it's, it's using our reality to communicate with us. It's the message that is important, not the reality we're in. Do you see what I mean? So to me, that's a really fascinating one. If, if people want to go and, um, and listen to it and well, i break it i break yeah. it down in a video on my channel um my youtube channel if people want to uh, we talk about that at length what that might mean it's really fascinating yeah the like god sea warrior says he heard of that one and he agrees with you yeah because it 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 doesn't make any sense unless it's a message <laughs> you know because it ruins the song you know everything in disney rhymes right you know, they, every, their songs rhyme. That's Disney. So when you hear it, it's so jarring. So if you just put a period after the, the alteration, which is fonder to found, then it's kind of interesting. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. is that something we need to ask? Is that something being asked of ourselves? Wherever we wander, wherever we roam, we can't be found. You know, is it like it made me think of, you know, are we lost in this realm? You know, like, you know, they'll show lost in space. Are we lost in a realm? you know, in like some sort of dream that we can't wake up from. And this, this is consciousness, consciousness trying to wake us up from the dream. Um, so I've thought about that a lot, you know, uh, it's, it's very mysterious. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, let's, let's get, we're going to start from the beginning and then we're going to go forward. So let's start at what was it like for you in school? Were you like a lot of us? Did you have a hard time paying attention? Were you good? Did you excel? Did you get in trouble? No, I was I was bullied. I was overweight kids when starting around uh, eight years old, fourth grade, I started gaining weight. So by fifth grade, I was the fat kid. You know, I was very intellectual, very creative. Um, so I was very shy um, through my whole childhood, very, very much bullied and, and went through a lot of 
uh, abuse that way at school. Um, and uh, so that, and, and so my entire school life was, you know, um, was, was, was traumatic. I mean, you know, it really was. I think I, to this day, I have PTSD over it. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I will, I That's still, bad, to this day, I still to this day have dreams. They come to my house and from the high school and tell me I didn't actually graduate and I have to come back. That's, that's like how deep seated this like uh, trauma is. But you know, what about, I think, um, did you have to do church or anything? At, at, yeah, I was school? I was raised Mormon. My parents were Mormon. Um, I have an older brother and a younger sister, so I'm the middle child. I'm the you know I'm the problematic Jan Brady of the family. <laughs> and uh, but um, but I started questioning the the church at 14. You know, I was my path is very much a spiritual seeking path. Um, I, for a time in my twenties, I lived on a interfaith ashram, which was very Eastern. I had a, a guru that I learned meditation from. So I was always seeking, you know, I, I remember in, when I was 14, I started reading, I read Shirley MacLaine's book out on a limb and that opened up the whole new age Eastern kind of philosophy to me, which, so I was very hungry to find out what is, why am I here? Who created me? Is there a reason I'm here? Um, what is this all about? And why is there so much suffering? Why is this such a really hard place to be, you know, a conscious being? Um, so I, I, you know, I always, uh, now when I was a senior in high school, I got involved in drama. I, I started acting in plays. Now I, I play piano. I'm a musician. I had started piano lessons when I was a young kid. So music was always my sanctuary. You know, that was my refuge where I would go. And uh, I wrote music for uh, our high school musical and and uh, I started writing uh, and, and really enjoying writing uh, short stories and that kind of thing. So when I was in high school, I, you know, I, uh, I, I, uh, <clears throat> I just lost my train of thought here. Uh, oh, I, I became interested in the theater. So <clears throat> when I was a senior, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts came to do regional auditions. This was an acting school in New York. And I decided I wanted to be an actor. So I auditioned, I got accepted. I went to New York and trained there at the American Academy. And um, I acted for, uh, you know, a couple of years, a lot of off, off Broadway plays and, you know, went out for commercials and auditioned for soap operas. And I mean, I was young and I was cute then, Brian. <laughs> you know, I, I had lost a hundred pounds my senior year in high school because we'd moved from Florida to Georgia and I wanted, and I knew no one would know me there. So I kind of, you know, I don't know, like Madonna, I kind of reinvented myself that, that summer. So I got there and I thought, I'm going to do what I want to do. I want to, I want to be an actor. I want to get on stage. I want to come out of this shell that I'm in this shyness. And, and, and I had done children's theater when I was a kid, 10, 11 years old that I really loved. Um, and so, so that kind of set me on my path. And then, then I, uh, a couple of years of doing that, I really, in fact, I was doing a play <clears throat> in New York and the, the script was horrible. And I remember complaining to the director and I said, you know, I, you know, can I change this line and make this a little better? And he said, you know, if you want to write a play, you should write one. So I did. And my first play was a big hit. It was done in New York off Broadway. And that kind of started my writing career. Wow. Nice. And what about, had, did you ever have any, uh, because we talk about this a lot on the show, you know, paranormal experiences when you were younger. Or yeah. When I was little, I could read my mother's mind. And the way this kind of manifested was we would be, say, we'd be in the car and I would, you know, she'd pick me up from school or whatever. And I would hear her say in, a, in her audible voice, do you want McDonald's or Burger King? And I answered her. And I said, well, I like Burger King hamburgers, but I got, I like, I prefer the McDonald's fries. And she said, I didn't ask you that yet. So this, this would happen on occasion um, where I would hear someone say something to me before they said it. Um, so that was kind of the only, you know, uh, that was sort of that sort of uh, experience I had there. Um, and uh, the, and I did have, I did have starting in my uh, early twenties uh, uh, out of body experiences in my sleep, um, the feeling of levitating above the bed. I had that a few times. People talk can about, talk about that a little. Yeah. Can you, can you talk about it a little? I mean, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. What it would do is it would, 
the sleep paralysis had um, had not really started yet. The first the 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 first experience I had was uh, I remember I was in my probably mid twenties and I was in New York and I was laying on my bed and I felt like this swirl of energy was going all around me. I looked into the room, it was dark and I could see tiny sparkles of light all in the room, like uh, fireflies or lightning bugs. Um, and it was, and there was static electricity in the room. And I remember feeling as if I was, had suddenly become weightless and, and, and I was lifting off the mattress. I could literally feel myself floating uh, above the mattress. And this, this swirl of energy just kept going around me. And Brian, the feeling, I cannot even describe it. It was so peaceful. Vanessa kind of, uh, I, I related to what Vanessa said the other night um, about mm -hmm. that feeling that you just cannot describe. It was just being yeah. enveloped in love and understanding and say, I felt safe. And uh, there was just this joyous feeling. Um, and, and so that, that was one experience there. The, the other experience I had with the sleep paralysis, when that started happening, I started to realize if I fought it, it felt scary. And I thought one day I thought, you know, the next time that happens to me, I'm not going to fight it. I'm mm -hmm. not going to think this is an enemy coming. I'm not going to be afraid and I'm going to see what happens. And what I discovered was I started to feel that presence again. It's like the mind is so terrified of what this alien presence is, the spiritual essence that it, 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 it almost, it's like, it scares you to, to push it away. You know, it, it, I think the mind interprets it as a, as a monster in the dark and it's really not. I think it's contact with our spiritual realm. Our spiritual world, yeah. I think, you know, wh whatever source we come from, I think it's that trying to reconnect. It's like, I feel like we lost our signal, you know, the, the line dropped and it's desperate yep. to reconnect with it and it's doing whatever it can to reach us. So, so those are some of the uh, paranormal experiences that I, you know, that I had. Um, there Did is one that yes. I would tell you about. Now this, unless you have, do you have any questions about, about that, that part? No, no, no. No, go ahead. Is that pretty clear? I mean, am I making sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so what's the other one? Okay. Hopefully I'm still on. You're here. Can you hear me? Uh, Hello? Oh. How can he not hear me? Can you hear me now, Brian? I can't hear you at all. Can you hear me? Hello? Uh, I don't know why. Like, oh, I'm sorry. The volume, the, the volume keeps going down on the, on my, on my headset. I uh, apologize. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, you, you said you had another one, another, uh, another sleep paralysis. Uh, what was the last thing you heard? Uh, it was about the, uh, the, the, the sleep paralysis. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. The and then you said the next time you said when the next time happens, you weren't going to be afraid of it. And then you said, Oh, I got another story to tell you. Do you have any questions? And then you kind of cut out. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of jump forward a little bit. So that's, that's kind of my background. Um, but my, my plays always deal with the supernatural, the spiritual, paranormal. Um, uh, a lot of that, is, is just in my work. That's what I like to write. So um, in 2011, I, I left California and I uh, bought a little house in Douglasville, Georgia, which is, um, it's west of Atlanta. And, and it's on the 33rd parallel North line. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, and I think this is very interesting because that's where I had the near death experience. And that's what started this whole thing for me. Um, because, uh, I, when I got there, I decided I was going to buy a piano. And mm -hmm. in 2010, my father and my grandmother died about a, a few days apart. So it was a big loss for our family. And um, I had decided at that point that I wanted to be closer to my brother who lived in Georgia as well. My sister and the rest of my family's in Florida. So, 
and I'd lived away for so long in New York and California that I, you know, I wanted to spend some, be closer, just close, closer to my siblings. So um, I bought this little house out in the, out in, in, uh, in Douglasville. And I decided I was going to buy a piano. So I went on Craigslist to look and there, a woman had a Pearl River uh, baby grand parlor grand piano for, I think it was $2,500 she wanted. And she was in Canton, Georgia. And I looked it up and I thought, and I found out that the Pearl River is also called the Canton River. It's another name for the, the Pearl River. And I thought, well, that's interesting. This woman is selling, she's selling a Pearl River piano and she's in Canton, Georgia. So I grabbed one songbook on my way out. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll just bring this sheet music that I can test the piano with. And I happened to take the um, theme music from the old TV series, Dark Shadows. I don't know if you remember that. Did you ever see it, Ryan? Uh -huh. Barnabas the Vampire? No. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. It, <laughs> yeah, a lot of, you're a little young for it. I mean, I saw it in syndication. I'm not old enough to have seen it when it was originally on, but it was a supernatural soap opera back in the sixties. It was pretty far out and crazy. And, uh, and so, and the music's really beautiful by the composer of the show. So I, I went ahead and took it. And when I got there, um, we were talking and she told me she had gotten cancer and, and was having treatments right around the time she got the piano and it just sort of had a bad memory for her and she never really taught, took lessons. And so I said, okay, well, let me, you know, let me play it. And so I pull out this, the song book and she sees it and she says, oh, wow, Dark Shadows. You know, my sister was on that show. Oh, wow. And I, and I said, really? She said, yeah. She told me who her sister was and her sister's picture was in the songbook. <laughs> I mean, this obscure, this obscure 1960s daytime soap opera that most people have never heard of in their life. And here it's her sister and I have the songbook on me. And so she called her sister up in LA and I talked to her and all that. So anyway, I'm on my way home and I thought, that's weird. This is like something, this is scripted. This, yeah. this is like I'm in a play or a movie or something. This is, mm -hmm. this is not a coincidence. So I started having that sense. I, um, at the time, I was, uh, I'd been hired to write a, co-write a screenplay for uh, a film that the director was hoping to get to Danny Glover. And it was about the Iraqi war and a, a veteran coming home and all of this. And, and uh I moved to this little town in Douglasville and I go to buy my incense at the smoke shop and a nice lady that I start talking with, she said, well, what do you do? And I told her and I said, you know, I'm, I'm writing this, this, she said, well, what are you doing now? And I said, well, I'm working on a movie. I said, which I normally write plays, but, and uh, I told her, I said, we've got a part in it. I'd really like to get it to Danny Glover. And Brian, she says to me, Danny Glover's my best friend. He's coming to stay with me. This weekend. <laughs> Oh my God. So now I'm really, and I remember going home that night and I thought to myself, did my plane crash on the way to Georgia a few months ago? Am I like dead? And is this like some afterlife realm where all your dreams finally come true? <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> where, where if I died and this is going to be my Nathan version of heaven, you know, is, you know, I'm going to get to write plays and do movies and do all this and entertain people and make people laugh. And I mean, it really was surreal. And so this, this went on with these, these experiences, you know, and, um, I'll get to the the uh, the near death part, but I had never, up until this point, I had never really questioned the reality. I assumed that what I was seeing on the news was true. Um, if yeah. they said some event took place, then that mean it did. Um, I remember in I think it was 2012 that um, that terrible uh, uh, event happened in in Connecticut, and um, I went into a deep depression, Brian. I mean, I really was devastated by that the innocence that uh suffered that day and died and the violence of it and the news and i mean i i got the book on it and read it and and i remember reading a part where it talked about people who were denying that it had happened and i remember thinking oh those people how horrible that they would ever question something like this that's so disrespectful to the victims <laughs> do you know what i mean I, so i mean i really do what you mean i i mean i've i've gotten the brunt of it for a decade now with that type of those type of comments you know so 
when you when you bought all that stuff hook line and sinker and and obviously we started off with the mandela effect thing and we're going to get there in a little bit did you did you question the news and and two party politics before you started to see the changes or no i did not i never questioned the reality as it was being presented um you know uh i i mean i have an open mind and i would always you know but i didn't i never looked real heavy into anything um one, in one of my plays, uh, it, it, there's a, a character who who believes that uh, a spaceship is coming, aliens are coming to take her to their planet. And so I did a lot of research about alien abduction at the time. And that was like, the, and, and I always loved supernatural and paranormal things, ghosts and, and hauntings. And so I was always really into that. But no, I never really, you know, I wasn't really looking at the reality. But with that event and going into the depression I went into, um, it's like, I, I started drinking real heavily, um, to the point where I was drinking way too much. Now I'm a big guy, so I can drink a lot, but I just, there was something about that particular event that just devastated me. So yeah, that's, that's what it was designed to do. It was just yeah, like a lot it, of it, it, everybody uh, down. Yes, yes, exactly. It's, um, what do they call it? Uh, uh, so it's 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 a tra it's a trauma based mind control is what it is, um, and you know when you're a victim of that you don't realize it's happening to you that you're being uh, attacked in that way. That event, that event destroyed the relationship between me and my own father because I I questioned it. And you know to hear that is so terrible, but it happens all the time. I mean we are divided from the people, sometimes the closest people to us. Um, I didn't have that experience because once I did wake up, my both my parents were dead. Now, I will say that when I was uh, 12, no, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 13, my mother was diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer. And um, so that was a very traumatic thing, you know, to go through. Um, so there had been a lot of tragedy in my life early. So I think that just brought up some of that old, uh, those old emotions and, um, and where, where my turning point was, was I had decided that I was, uh, I was in my house. It was, uh, in Atlanta. It was almost right before midnight. And I had been doing some, um, I had decided about a week before I was going to stop drinking, you know, because, uh, I talked to my literary agent and he said that the, you know, the director didn't like the direction the script was going in. I thought, you know what, I better, I better get myself together here because I don't want to lose this, this job, you know. So I did not realize, Brian, how dangerous it is to stop drinking cold turkey. I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't kill know. You. That's what, yeah. yeah. Uh, alcohol and benzos are two things that can actually kill you from coming off of them. The other stuff won't even kill you. Those will kill you. You have a seizure, bro. Yeah, you come off of heroin and you feel like you're gonna die, but you, but you're not. You come off of alcohol yeah, and benzos, and it will it can kill you. Die. And, and yeah. so I didn't realize that's what ha was happening to me. And I was doing my meditations one night, and uh, you know, like I always did, and I felt this energy in my body, and I thought, you know, having experience kundalini awakening and and all that eastern stuff you know knowing that there's energy in the body and sometimes you can release it and feel it it's very real um i thought that that was what was happening but later i found out i was actually going into a seizure um yeah. so what happened that night october 25th 2013 i i i had i went into a series of seizures my heart stopped and i died in my living room and that's mm -hmm. when i had the experience that changed everything. And um, I, I, because one of the things that had, because it's, it's hard to put into words um, and I'll just talk about what's relevant as far as our conversation up to now. Um, I encountered a being human looks someone that I had never seen before. Cause what I realized was I was no longer in my living room, you know, I never felt any pain. There was never any kind of discomfort, nothing. Um, yeah. So, so I remember I had a picture of my guru on the mantle, and I'm looking at it. Neem Karoli Baba. You can Google him and see what he looks like. He was a uh, Indian spiritual teacher, Maharaji. They called him, and um, I was looking at the photograph, and 
suddenly, and I'm standing up in the living room, I'm feeling this energy surge through my body. And I, it was like his eyes in the photograph opened, Brian. And there was someone looking at me. Now, mm -hmm. people will say, you know, well, this is DTs, this is hallucination. Well, it could have been, but this is what I saw. So I'm just going to tell you what I saw. What I don't know what was doing it, but this is what I experienced um, as honestly as I can recall. Um, and when his eyes opened, I knew they weren't Baba's eyes. They weren't that guru's eyes. They were some other being's eyes looking through his eyes. And I heard out loud the words, peekaboo, I see you. And I said, you're real. I've always known that you were real because what, and I'll, I'll just back up a little bit because for the nine months up until this night, I had had this really strange paranormal experience. I would sit down to play the piano. It would be late at night. And as, and there was one particular song I would play. And as I was playing that song, I could feel the presence of some being in my bedroom off the living room. This was a little two-story house, but my bedroom was on the bottom floor. And I could feel it, Brian. And with the feeling, it wasn't a scary feeling. It wasn't, uh, you know, I mean, I didn't know, is this a ghost? Is this a haunting situation I'm having here? Um, so I'm, 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 I'm feeling this presence and it continued on for three nights. And on the third night that it happened, I felt this, this love. I mean, I can't, I, just this calmness came over me. And I said out loud, you can come in here and listen to me play if you want to. You know, you don't have to stay in the bedroom. That's how real this presence was to me. I was actually communicating and I knew that it would hear me. And it yeah. came, I felt it come in and he sat down or she, I didn't know the, you know, gender of this being, but I could feel a powerful energy and it sat down right next to me as i played and brian it was like all of a sudden it was like playing through me the piano and i'm playing but i'm not aware of what i'm i'm not looking at the sheet music i don't know what it was i was playing it was no song i wow. even know so that had been happening so i was curious who is this so the night of the near-death experience when the eyes opened in the picture of my guru and i realized that's not his eyes that's someone else's eyes i immediately thought oh is this 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 being that likes to hear me play the piano so that was the connection i made that that's who this is you know um and then i heard and everything else that went on was was telepathic it wasn't it wasn't like i saw the face moving the lips moving and i heard a voice i i i was it was communicated to me that what i needed to do was take the picture go lay down on the couch on my stomach and just hold the picture and look at it and don't let go. And so mm -hmm. that's what I did. So I'm thinking, looking back now, I think I probably was getting ready to fall over, you know, yeah. and I could have really hurt myself with hitting the, you know, the mantle with my head or, you know, cracking my head on the end tape, you know, who knows? Um, so as soon as I lay down and I looked at the picture, it was like something took me out of the living room out of consciousness where I was and I was in a completely different place. And that, that began. And what happened was um, the being that I encountered was the, and it was just a face. That's all I saw. And I only saw it for maybe three or four or five seconds at the most, I'd say mid to uh, early to mid thirties male, um, you know, very pleasant, had a beautiful smile. Um, and, and the memory I have is it's almost like he looked surprised to see me. Now, I didn't know who this was. It wasn't a face I remembered or, you know, had any connection to. But it was like um, his, he was full of light. His, the light just radiated out from him. There was, you know, I don't even know where he was. I don't even know where I was at this point except looking. Um, and I said to him, am I dead? And he just smiled. And I asked him that two other times that night, because what he did was he would put, he put me back into my body. I got up off the couch. I walked into the bathroom to pee. And I remember peeing and thinking, okay, I'm alive. I'm peeing here. So I'm not dead. Yeah. I walked back into my bedroom, sat on the bed, and then I was gone again. And wow. then, the and great. then, and then he put me back in later 
and that was it. That was the last time. So it was almost like wherever I was, I couldn't stay the whole duration. You know, um, I remember later just the physical uh, strain on my body. This physically, it really. And I do remember. Were you like, were you, like you were like worn down after this? Were you physically drained? What did oh it, my what god! Did yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. Like what, was, like, you know what it felt like? It, fi- it felt like getting electrocuted. It felt like it felt like putting your, you know, I mean, that was what my body looked like afterwards. Now, a lot of that's the DTs and all that, too. But the whole thing was that's why it's hard to pull out what was what, you know, what was the DTs? What was the detoxing from the alcohol? And what was this experience? Um, now, I did remember I did go in the bathroom and look at my eyes and I my eyes were so huge. You, I mean, and I didn't blink. I don't think I blinked for two hours after it. Um, and that's when I knew, you know, but one of the things that he had, that, that he communicated with me was he said, this was the first thing I remember him saying. He said, the world you think you're living in is not the world you're li- living in. You're being deceived. Wow. So, so what, and so I was that- like, Right after that, did you change your that outlook? Was, on that was when I started investing. Because then the other thing that I said to him, I said, why Why? what happened in Connecticut? Why did that happen? And Brian, he said to me, communicated this thought to me, no children suffered that day. And I thought, okay, then you took their souls out of their bodies before it happened. Somehow you're able to do that to retrieve a soul before it goes through that kind of horrible trauma, death, especially these little children. It wasn't till a few months later that I saw Robbie Parker on YouTube and (laughs) realized it was like, holy Barry Manilow. It didn't even happen. That's what he meant. That's why no children suffered because there weren't any. That is one hell of an interesting way into uh realizing these events are fake holy shit that's awesome so so that's why i started investigating everything 9 11 um space nasa the moon landing all of it you know um david ike and the archons and gnosticism and is this a prison planet and you know uh the demiurge i mean everything you could think of i could not get I, I could not get enough of it. I was just starving for this information. I needed to know the truth because I realized once I saw that with the Robbie Parker thing, I realized then that he's right. The world I think I'm living in is not the world I'm in. There's something else going on here. And there's a reason that I've suffered. That was the other thing he said. He said, you you suffer because you don't know the truth. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, how do I know the truth when I find it? And he said, you'll stop suffering. And I thought, okay, that's pretty easy. I don't want to suffer anymore. I need to know what the truth is. So I started seeing this massive deception that's so ancient. It's been always, it seems like it's always been a deception here that this, this is a, you know, a realm of lies and deceit. So, so that prepared me for that piece of my awakening. And then the other piece that he provided was, he said to me, he said, um, communicated this. He said, you are going to notice something. Something's going to come into your awareness in a year to two years from now. He said, and what this is going to be, he said, it's going to force. He said, you're stuck. You're all stuck. This is going to force a giant leap in the evolution of human consciousness. He said, it's going to take that to get you where you need to be because he says it's going to, I said, well, you know, and I, I wanted understanding and he showed me the image of uh, some sort of divine intervention. So for a year and a half, that's, that's October, 2013. So I'm waiting for a year and a half. Like, what is this going to be? Is there going to be a miracle in the sky? Is a UFO going to land on the White House lawn? You know, I didn't know, Brian. I just <laughs> something. Well, 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 <laughs> what was it? Was it was it the Berenstein change into the Berenstein? <laughs> you know what's hilarious? 
And see, this is the other thing. This is why this is an anchor one for me. When I lived in California, I did some, I helped out this, um, this organization. It was a nonprofit organization. And they were doing a world, a, a San Francisco premiere of Sex in the City, one of the movies. So mm -hmm. we were throwing out ideas and all of this. And one of the ideas I came up because they were serving this community it was a health organization. They were serving a lot of transgender people in the transgender community. Mm -hmm. And I came up with the idea t-shirts that say sex change in the city, which is funny, <laughs> you know, it is, so, I like it. <laughs> you know, I mean, because that's what the name of the show was, you know? Yeah. So, so in August of 2015, a friend of mine called me from Australia and he said, you did, you did, you know, that show sex and see, you did some stuff for them. Right. And I was like, yeah, I said, kind of, you know, not, not on their show, but yeah, related to it. He said, go on YouTube and look what it's called now. And I'll never forget it. I opened up the opening credits. And when I saw that bus go by and it said sex and the city, I couldn't, I was stunned. I could not believe what I was seeing. It, it was just, and I thought that's what he meant. This is what he's, this is it. This is the, the change in the reality. He's going to change the reality. You know, whatever's going to cause us to. So what was so crazy about it and when I went online to look for articles to find evidence that it had been what I remembered, that's when I, I did have the first example of a page refreshing and changing from sex into and. I saw that right before my eyes. Then I very quickly encountered pieces that looked like cover pieces that were misleading to try to people make oh, people think that it was a, a, a lawsuit that made them change their name. They're like deliberate misinformation. Do you know what I mean? <clears throat> oh, yeah. There's clearly disinformation to make people doubt the changes. I mean, we talk about this all the time. Did you just say you saw residue change in front of your eyes, though? Can you can you tell people that again? That is what I caught you say, right? Can you tell? Yeah, people I that? found it was on it was on Amazon.com and it was the, uh, some soundtrack album had loaded up the theme song from Sex in the City. And, and the, the image on the on the album sleeve or, you know, whatever custom thing they did for it for that particular digital track it said sex in the city theme so right before i went to and i was like oh great this shows what i remember so right before i went to take a screenshot it's like the page refresh and it now said and yep happened right before my eyes so i got to see that and um and see and at that time the only thing i found about about it was I think it was Fiona Broom's website. Uh, it was, yeah. and I, that's where I heard about Berenstain, where Berenstain, Berenstain Bears, and I think they mentioned one other thing, but there were hard, there weren't, I don't remember any videos about it. And this is August yeah. 2015. I don't remember any videos on YouTube. Maybe there were a handful, but by, yeah. by there, that there fall, I know I was, um, I was doing all my Mandela talk on Facebook, you know what I mean? And, okay. Uh, I don't know what they really was for videos, you know, if they probably came in late 2015, I'm thinking. Well, it by fall, by November, October, yeah. it was everywhere. They were all over the place. And that's when I started seeing the, you know, the shook videos where they're making the funny face. And I was like, oh, they're clowning this. This is, this is weird. So, and, and that was when I first had my experience with talking to people about the Mandela thing and seeing the reaction. So that was, there was one other thing. I assumed when Sex in the City changed to Sex and the City, that was going to be the lead news that night on CNN. That's how naive I was. <laughs> I was calling everybody in the world <laughs> that I knew to tell them it had changed. They must have thought I was nuts. I assumed they all would remember it the way I did. And, and in fact, I did call one friend who had the DVDs, and she was shocked that it had changed. So she shared my memory. But um, – yeah. And another friend, we had to go down to Barnes and Noble and look in the store to see for ourselves. She's like, this can't be, that's in. And I said, let's go down and actually, because I had to see it physically in my hands to believe it really happened. So, yeah. so that was a, that was the big one for me. And, um, and so that's when I started just researching and trying to find residual evidence. And, and immediately, you know, I, I, I felt that in, in seeing, in seeing the hostile, so the fact that it wasn't the lead on the news, the fact that other people didn't remember it the way it used to be and the hostile reaction that people would have towards it. 
the the downloads all of that behavior when someone when you let when you you give them the message that this is happening that was where i really started to see okay something's going on here that's very strange because yeah. they're not acting like a normal human being would act being presented with this information there's something else going on here and and it was just so bizarre you know and um and then you know you have your friends think you're crazy you know that whole thing that we've gone through and and just for me slowly finding a community you know that i could you know that i could could share this stuff and see that they were experiencing some of the same things that i was and then the the next big thing for me was was uh i think it was winter 2000 i don't know if it was winter 2015 was it was the apollo uh 13 flip-flop that was a big oh, one man. for me well that was huge yeah that was huge so why don't you t take yeah. us through why that was so big for you? But I mean, we we know many of the reasons because the residue disappeared and all this. But go ahead, explain. Yeah. Well, I think for me that you know, as as much as I knew that something was happening, even knowing, even sort of being prepared that something you know, mind blowing and earth shattering was going to take place in a year and a half to two years, even knowing that, I still doubted myself. I thought this is, you know, maybe this is me, something's wrong in my head, you know, and I just, mm -hmm. you know, and I sort of prayed about it and I said, you know, I need, I need to know it's real. You know, I, I really need to know this is real. And um, that's, it was right after that, that it flipped back. And I felt that was a gift. I felt that was a gift yeah. to those of us who had been struggling up to that point and may, being made to feel crazy that we were given a great gift and being able to witness something that actually happened that we would never doubt again in our ever again. No one would ever be able to shake our truth that we knew what we had experienced and what had taken place, whether yeah. even if the whole oh, world didn't see it. It was such a big one because I mean, obviously it's such, it's one of the most iconic quotes of all time. So the fact that that changed really grabbed our attention. So, and I really feel that's why some of these huge things changed to grab our attention. So I felt that grabbed our attention and while all our attention was on it, making videos about it and everything, it flips back, videos disappear. I mean, if there was any doubt that this was supernatural at that point, well, you're right, man. I mean, that seals the deal. Yeah. So, so to me, that was, so that, so all of that was happening. So I was getting it all at one time. And it's, I, I think I'm fortunate in that I had a spiritual foundation, you know, there to sort of begin with a little bit, because I, I don't know how people who don't have that are handling this. Um, this is, this is intense. You know, you, you know, Brian, I do think that you are probably a Jedi Knight or you're in training to be one. I think this is, <laughs> this is definitely, Why? this is spiritual warfare, unlike anything I've ever seen. You know, because it's the, the mind, it's, it's, it's the battle. The battlefield is in the human mind here. That's where it's happening in our consciousness. Um, you know, the people here are in cages and they're walking free. They don't even realize they're in bondage being held in a, in a, in a deceit. So it, it's, you know, and they can make it look so wonderful on one hand, <laughs> you know, to really make you think, no, this is okay. You know, this, this, there's nothing wrong here, but um, for someone like me that always had the feeling there was just something wrong with this reality that this, why did the world have to be the way it was? It didn't make sense to me, you know? Um, and so, so that was going on. And, and then the other piece of it, which, you know, I'll, I'll share a little bit about um, when, after the near death experience, I, I went to the hospital, I was in the hospital for three days and when I, uh, when I came out, you know, I was thinking about, I was thinking about my mother who had, you know, gotten sick when I was 13. And at the time we were living in uh, Vero Beach, Florida, in a neighborhood called the Highlands. I was 13 when this happened. And I was thinking about my mom a lot during those three days I was in the hospital and I, was, I came home and, um, you know, I just started to pray. You know, I said, I, I need to know what I experienced was real that night i need to know that you're real and what you showed me and the things you 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 know you you revealed to me were are real you know cuz i'm thinking maybe it was a hallucination you know maybe it was the dt's or or whatever 
um, you know, a mind losing oxygen and starting to create. And I heard, and, and a few months before this, a friend of mine had told me about Pandora Music app. So I had, you know, I'd put in probably about, you know, 99 stations. I think that was the limit with a free account at the time. And I had it on my laptop and I had it on shuffle. So it was shuffling through all these different stations. Mm -hmm. And I heard again, this, this presence say to me, he said, there's a song playing right now on your Pandora uh, go app, go over and read the lyrics and you'll have your answer to whether I'm real or not, or whether what you experienced was real. So yeah. I go over there. It's a song I never heard before. It's called Time of Your Song by Matis mm -hmm. Yahoo. Uh, isn't it, it sort of an Israeli reggae? It was sort of a, a reggae song. And Brian, I read, I go down, I'm reading the lyrics on the screen. I get to the sixth line and it says, I see myself in the highlands at 13. Wow. Asking questions of the present day me. And man, I'm going to tell you something. I lost it. I just, I burst out crying like a baby. I just felt, and I was like, you're real. This, how do you do this? How are you able to have this song, have that line in it? That's me. That's what happened. I was 13 in the highland. It was just beyond. So then again, I'm thinking now this is, so maybe I did die. You know, he told he never answered me yes or no. He just smiled. I asked three times, am I dead? Each time he took me out, I asked that. And he would never give me an answer, yes or no. Um, so at that point, I, I said, you know, and I'm just having a conversation, you know, in my living room. And I, I said out loud, I, I, I feel bad because I'm a little embarrassed. You obviously know me, but I don't know you. I don't even know your name. You know, I was thinking, I wish I'd asked him what his name was, you know. <clears throat> and as I'm listening to the Pandora, the very next song that comes on, this is a random shuffle on the Pandora music app, is Jim Croce, I Got a Name. And I thought, you're talking to me through this music. And then the next song, I knew the next song was going to be his name. I knew he was going to tell me what his name was through the music. I just knew it. So I'm waiting to see what the next song is. You know, I can barely breathe. I've got my cam I'm trying to take picture screenshots. You know, I'm like, no one's going to believe this. This is insane. Um, how is this possible? And, and so the very next song that played, it was an Olivia Newton-John song from her 1976 album, Don't Stop Believing." And this was an album as a little kid, I begged my mother to buy me. I saw it in Sears. We were shopping here in Florida. And I just, you know, records were $8. They were expensive back then. We didn't have a lot of money. You know, my dad worked for the phone company and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. And, um, and she got it for me. And there was a song on the album and that's the song that played. And it was called Sam, S-A-M. And I remembered the song. I said, okay, so your name is Sam. I don't know any Sams, you know. And I decide, so I go to Google, I open it up, and I type in Sam name meaning. And Brian, it said Sam in Hebrew means name of God or God has heard. Dude, and that I, is crazy. Yeah, that's, and that's what happened. So, you know, so I started to, um, to, use the music and what i started to notice was i would get song messages and then when i would leave my house there would be things in the physical reality that would confirm the song that had played earlier so i all so i started feeling like this is a communication this is a way to to for this being to communicate and you it can access our physical reality to talk to us so i was using the fm radio I can, you know, I would walk we're grocery shopping. I would get messages, songs that would come through the, the speaker. I mean, I know it sounds insane. If I were to tell a psychiatrist this, you know, I'd be Baker acted. You know, I'd be yeah, well, now in the Hoo Hoo Hotel. So obviously, once you start seeing the Mandela changes, you're going to see a message in most of it. I mean, you're going to, you're already on that path where you're thinking that that things are, are of a method. So, yeah, so when so I wasn't thinking uh, it's CERN, it's a D-wave computer, it's multiple yeah. timelines. I I knew from the very first one I experienced with Sex in the City that this was communication from a divine intelligence 
who is who is who is intervening in our reality because we are in serious trouble. <laughs> this is an emergency situation. Yeah. And uh, I don't think, Brian, honestly, that any human power can fix this. That's how bad it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need we need really powerful help <laughs> with what we're up against. I know. This, Nathan, this deception take, and this let's mind. Take quick five, let's take a quick five minute break. I have to take a break. Five minutes. We'll That'd right be back, great. Right? Okay. Go to, yeah. Yeah. I got to go to the Sounds bathroom good. and get my coffee. All right, guys. We'll be right back. Okay. I'll go ahead and mute. Did you know your reality is being put to the test? The Panama Canal no longer runs east and west. Things you are sure happen never did in this reality. The crunchy cereal with the captain now has an apostrophe. Some are changed for many folks. Shit, that punctuation now just showed up on different strokes. This shit can't be attributed to only digital content. Take a look at South America. They moved the whole fucking continent. 
even pop in your copy of Star Wars. It could be 30 years old. Shit, when is C-3PO? Not all fucking gold. Maybe you haven't noticed the changes yet. Open your eyes, trust your senses, and you realize the Mandela effect. I'm from the reality where the youngest Jackson was a girl. Volkswagen logo had no line and Ford had no curl. The Black Tom attack we didn't learn of in school. It was always who will save your soul sung by Jewel. The music ones really stand out to me. It's no longer I want to paint it black in this reality. People writing it off as bad memory. Even with Superman, Chris Reeves running your trap, dismissing it is one of my pet peeves. Everything I research, people say it's a psyop. Even simple things like pointing out the towers can't collapse from the top. Somehow we are experiencing merging timelines. For more research, check out my site, The Real News Online. All right, everyone. Welcome back to Dose of Reality. Brian Stavely. I'm here with Nathan Sanders. Nathan, you back? I'm here, Brian. Awesome. So we were kind of at the point where yeah. we got into your first big Mandela. Um, because of your spiritual guidance, it seems, through other ways, you, you kind of knew that this wasn't CERN and parallel timelines and universes and all this. And we'll, we'll get pretty deep into that. But what, what happened to you after... Um, Sex in the City. What was the next big one for you? I'm sure it was probably what JFK in South America or um, Sally Fields' Oscar acceptance speech. That was a big one for me. You know, being in the uh, the theater industry, entertainment industry, um, that was a huge one. I remember watching that with my sister, my little sister, and my mother in 1985 when she got up and said it. I remember we laughed yeah. and said that was so weird. Yeah. And it was immediately that all the late night comics were, uh, were, you know, uh, making fun of her. They were mocking her, you know, so they're not going to mock her with something she didn't say, <laughs> you know, so that was a major one. And that's one of the few that my sister could see. So that was one I was able to talk to her about. And she said, no, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Cause see, it's an anchor memory. You know, my mm -hmm. sister lost her mother at 16 so that is a beautiful memory she has of my mother four years before she died. Um, the two of them, you know, the three of us watching it together. So these are, this is what they can, they can, they can take Miss Memory, you know, and play with it all they want and use it as a weapon. But we know what these anchor memories are. We know the attachment we have emotionally to these memories and, and, and their attempt to try to have people doubt this i think is absolutely monstrous to do that and they know exactly what because they know the memories are real they know this is happening i saw that as soon as sex in the city changed you know i i and i could see this that there was something changing the reality desperate to get our attention and something else that was absolutely doing everything in its power to hide that and make sure we did not get the message that was coming through yeah. to me, it felt like a prison break. You know, someone is slipping us a map to a tunnel to how to get the hell out of this jail, <laughs> you know, and, and yeah. these are the guards keeping you from receiving the help. To me, it was an, it was, it, it was an SOS had been heard and something was coming back. You know, um, I, I, I really felt that strongly. So what I was doing at this time you know, I, 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 I knew I had to stop drinking. So that was the first thing I took care of. You know, I went into a, a 12 step program and a lot of people probably know about those and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and, and really started to, to clear my mind of the alcohol and make sure I, cause I realized I have to be in my sober mind to really deal with what's happening. You know, I don't want to miss anything and I don't want to mess this up. And so this alcohol obviously is not healthy for me. Anything that you die from, from stopping is probably not a good idea, right? <laughs> you know, if you're, if you have a trouble controlling it, you know, some people can drink and have no problem. Um, but for me, it became a, it became an issue. You know, I was using it to sort of as a, uh, you know, a way to, to feel better, you know, to lift myself out of this depression. Um, so that so that was going on at the same time that I'm getting these song messages. See, this was the other thing that was happening. And I only told a few very close people that this was going on. Um, 
And what was happening, Brian, I would ask the question um, in my own mind, meaning I wouldn't say it out loud. And I would open the Pandora shuffle and a song would play that would answer my question. And so I, I started having like conversations with using this as a, it's kind of like an oracle is the way I thought of it. Yeah. You know, yeah. that this was a divination yeah. technique because always having been a musician, music is my world. You know, I, if I had to choose between theater or plays or film and, and mu music, I would choose music. That's, that's, that's my refuge. And so, yeah. um, so for the music to be coming and, and, and I was starting, so I, you know, I, I decided at that time that, you know, and I had asked Sam, because that's what I call him. That's the name he gave me. I said, Sam, you know, do you want me to share these, some of these messages that I'm getting? And he sent me messages that showed that it. So over a period of about a year and a half, I had two Facebook groups where I posted and shared and documented over 2000 intelligent responses using the Pandora wow. uh, music app and also using the FM radio, um, walking into a store, like a grocery store and they're playing music and also sharing the physical reality confirmations, the synchronicities, the numbers, all of this to me was like, it was all a picture. If you put it all together, it was like, it, 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 it was really incredible. Um, but I was nervous about going public with the messages. So basically I, um, uh, I, uh, you know, Shane from Unbiased and on the Fence. Yeah. You know, Shane. Yeah. He's a great guy. And my friend Jim and I were going to go and do a podcast and start talking about some of these issues. You know, some of the things we were experiencing with it, because he was, he, now that, now Jim saved my life. Jim was a friend I met here in, uh, I live in Port St. Lucie, Florida. Um, and he, uh, been a musician himself, been a, been, been a big band back in the seventies. And so we had a lot in common. He was a songwriter and the first Mandel effect I told him about, um, see his, his big one is the water changing from hot, hot and cold switching sides. Do you, are you affected by that one? Um, um Brian, I now is it right now it's cold on the left and hot on the right. Correct. Or is it the other way around? I don't even know what it's it the other is. way. I Jim and I both remembered hot being on the right and cold on the left. Then it switched. So now cold is on the right and hot is on the left. So that was something we had in common. So, and you know, and he had been in, investigating Nibiru, and he was very open minded. And so he was really the only friend here that I could talk to in person. Everyone else was online. Mm -hmm. And I talked to him about the song messages, and he said, "Nathan, I think you have to document them." You know, and um, so you know, I con Shane. I don't remember even now how Shane and I first connect. I think I just watching his shows on the Mandel Effect, and I kind of sent him a message, told him what was happening, and and Jim and I had decided to do this uh, this this podcast called Synchronicity, Mysticism, and the Mandel Effect. And so Shane hosted the first seven episodes, I think we did, and all it was is me showing the song messages and the synchronicities. Um, but, um, and so there, so that was going on. So there, you know, I just felt like I wanted to, and I did a, quite a few Mandela effect. Now I'll tell you one video I did. Um, now I will tell everyone, um, YouTube started deleting my content about a year and a half ago. Um, the first one they deleted, which was really odd to me, I had taken and put together a playlist of every song that I had posted in our Facebook group so that you could go and you could listen to the song that was being played, you know, when I would ask a question. Mm -hmm. And so I had uh, maybe, I don't know, it was hundreds of songs and they sent me a community guideline strike and deleted my playlist. And these were all what? videos that are already on YouTube. They weren't, That's Brian, crazy. they weren't anything I even uploaded myself. They were all just other videos. Of songs. I mean, it was Carpenters and ABBA and <laughs> you know what I mean? It, I mean, it yeah. was nothing that would break a community guideline. And they took it. And then it's they not, took another it's video not your down. Content anyways. It's, it's not even your content anyways, right? No, it wasn't. Playlist. It's, just, it's, it's like they didn't want people to hear the songs. 
it was so strange. So I saw the writing on the wall. And I, at this point, I thought, you know what, I'm going to set everything to private. So you'll only see about four videos there. Everything else is set to private. Um, eventually, I hope to be able to have a website where I can load everything up. But that's the only place. I don't have those on a hard drive. Those are just there on YouTube. So if they delete the channel, they're all gone. Um, so that's why you don't see a whole lot over there. And, um, you know, and I just I just shared the messages as much. I, I asked about the Mandela effect. He said, I said, uh, you know, who's who's responsible for the Mandela effect? He takes credit for it. He said he's doing it. And I asked questions about why. And they're fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Um, I stopped a year and a half ago. I don't share any more messages. I do communicate and pray and I keep in contact and I get messages for myself that I just, you, you know, that I are just for my own personal use, but I don't po post anything publicly anymore. And I haven't for a year and a half. It, it got really crazy. You know, there's a, a lot of suffering people out there. And when you put yourself out there with your face and, and who you really are, like you do, Brian, you know, you're not, you're not under an assumed identity. I'm not either. I mean, I'm a public yeah. person. Um, and so getting some of the death threats and, and really cryptic, just terrible messages. I just, I got to where I had to, had to back off. And, uh, you know, I felt I had asked everything that I could think of to ask. I felt like it was all there documented. If anyone ever wanted to go and look at it later down the road, you know, whether it's a novelty or just some strange, strange event that took place, or it'll mean something later down the road. I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm open to whatever, but I just, you know, and I know people are using music as a result. They first heard about it, you know, through what my experience with the near death experience. And I know Vanessa VA uses music and finds um, beautiful messages from from her higher power through it. And um, and that's what I do. You know, I feel it's another tool that if, if you've never thought about it, you might start paying attention to the music that's playing on the radio when you get in the because, you know, this is the thing, Brian. If if whatever if this intelligence can can move South America, <laughs> it yeah. can play whatever song it wants. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Okay. <laughs> you know, what we're seeing is so beyond anything that we could ever imagine anyway. You know. I know. What did you think when you first saw South America move, by the way? I, I I, well, to be honest, I thought biblical, you know, I mean, having grown up Mormon, we did have the King James version of the Bible and it was trespasses that I learned it out of was our King James Bible. The Mormon church does not use any other translation. At least they didn't when I was a kid. Um, so that, you know, uh, I'm sorry, what was the question? What, what, what did you think when you first saw South America movie? You said biblical. And then oh, 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 so biblical. Yeah, that's right. I lost my train of thought. See, I'm old. I'm going to be 53 in a few weeks. All right. So. All right. Cause you're going to have to remind me a few times. I, I get lost a few times. Too, <laughs> my point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. March 14th. I'm actually, I'm a pie baby. I was born on 314. And um, which is interesting. Albert Einstein was also born on 314. I find that really interesting that that it's an interesting number if, if you look into 314. So those kind of things. But um, but I thought biblical. I thought of the place in the Bible in Revelations where it talks about the islands would move out of their places. You know, I mean, I really, and that was one change that I saw because I was working on a play in 2014 and I was going to use Isaiah 11, 6 in the script. So in my notebook, I had my grandmother's Bible, which was, you know, 80 years old. And I had written, I'd copied out the word, the verse in my notebook. Uh, you know, the lion, it was, and the lion shall lay down with the lion and the lion shall lay down with the lamb. So I had it still in my notebook. And then when I went and grabbed the book, the Bible and saw that it was no longer what I had written, I realized that was happening too. Um, and, and, and so many of the changes, like when I first became aware of the lion becoming the wolf, the place yeah. I moved into right after that, the roommate that I was renting the room from, he his thing is wolves. And I walk in the house and there are wolves everywhere. I am surrounded by them. I mean, plaques, blankets, I mean, sofa throws, I mean, portraits, <laughs> statues, everywhere, wolves. 
That's that's <laughs> I'm sorry, say that again. You uh, went robot. New, I said that's that new reality reinforcement. Yeah, yeah, it was really fascinating, you know, to see to, to see it. Um so so a lot of this, I mean, I'm you know, I I I see what could be playing out is almost a biblical story here. It feels like a great um, battle, an epic battle like you would find in like the Odyssey, you know, in some of the, the Greek stories. And um, But it does feel like almost like we're on some sort of hero's journey. Do you know what I mean? That we're, yeah, no, exactly. we're facing ridicule and we're, we're, we're facing ridicule and mockery and families oh, disowning us. I mean... Let's talk about the mockery. What do you want to talk about first? People taking updates in front of you or the mockery against us by the media and whatnot? Where do you want to go first? We got to talk about both of these in depth. Have you seen people take the updates in yeah, front well, of you? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. And what what I find most strange is they is it almost I've gotten to the point now after five years of doing this that I can predict how they're going to react after they first once i get the initial reaction i know then what their next excuse or justification is going to be it's you mm -hmm. know it's it's from what my ex observation is it's almost like it's a script that they're running like a program yeah. and it's set up to have these firewalls so when you introduce something to the consciousness that is not prepared to handle that it has mm -hmm. like a set thing list it goes down to keep them in the reality it's like something is keeping them in the reality that this is real. They can never question it. I, I now, wanna, why? That's the big question. You know, well, what you is know, it doing I, that? Why? You know. Well, you. I mean, if you haven't heard my idea, I'm sure you probably have. But I mean, you know, I used to look at this whole thing as a positive, and and I still look at the changes and the Mandela effect as a positive but as far as the updates and the backstories that come into our timeline like you know all the new jfk videos all the new ed mcmahon videos and all this in my opinion that's coming from an evil force because that's that's the spiritual tug of war to make you doubt the changes and that's exactly what it's doing when these people take the updates they're doubting the changes now some of it can be ai and people working at google and all these things changing information but again things popping into our timeline to reinforce the new reality well, that has to be supernatural. So there's going to be a, a, a darker force at play. Would you agree with that or disagree? What, what do you think? Yes, yes, I do. I, I definitely see it as two opposing forces. The force that's the force that is doing the initial changes for a purpose, I believe, to communicate something to us or to grab our attention in an emergency situation, <laughs> you know, or it is, you know, against this other completely opposing force that is um that has to hide any change anything that makes the person question the reality um and 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 so is that what is doing that how can it create see i i the, the question is how does if it's an article it's one thing you know an article can be yeah. backdated and created and put online but when it's like you talk about when it's actual footage from divers going down you know um, that yeah. kind of thing, then I, I, I don't know. I really don't know what, but it does feel like it's a battle and it's a war, um, between these two opposing forces and, and, um, you know, and how that works, I'm not really sure, you know, and I've, I've wondered, you know, I've wondered, are these people AIs or are they organic, some sort of organic robot? Are they a computer program? Is this, is this a hologram? I mean, yeah. I, I'm, you know what, Brian, I'm going to, I don't know. So I'm going to keep everything yeah. on the table. I have my like more probables and my less probables, you know, but, but I'm, I'm I want to stay as open as I can. I, because about that, I'm not exactly sure how it goes. Now, some of the song messages that I did receive about that question, Sam sent me the song shells from uh, the Find and Dory soundtrack album. So what, and, is, what is that? Basically something without a soul, an empty, an empty bar. And, and he sent Valley of the Dolls, that there's something unreal 
or empty about these people. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is, are we dealing with a biblical or ancient culture demonic possession type thing that is overtaking them? Are we dealing with a some sort of uh, artificial intelligence that has taken over their their minds? Are we dealing with um, sort of an alien parasitic consciousness that's that's come here? You know, I'm I I how this is happening. I'm I'm trying. You know, I've I've really thought about every possible uh, scenario. You know, what it could be. So I'm just I, I don't know. What do you? Th I mean, what are you leaning towards? Man, I, I've been having a very similar stance because I say this whole idea of uh, NPCs or soulless beings, I'm really, really on the fence because I, I really just don't know. So I don't really commit to one way or another because they do act really, really strange. And here's the thing that makes it hard. And and this is, again, I tell people you can't have emotional attachment. And look at me here. It's like, well, it, it's really hard to deal with that. Like if some of these people are NPCs, well, a lot of them are our loved ones, right? How does that go? You've had emotional exactly. connections your whole life. You've had emotional connections your whole life to these people that you love. And now what? Some of them don't have a soul. Like, how does that work? And is the emotional attachment just clouding our vision? And are they soulless? I mean, what's going on? I don't know. Well, see, if we're dealing with if we're dealing with uh with say, okay, say for instance, it's a parasite that has taken over the mind. These people have a soul, it's their mind that's been affected. There's yeah. something interfering with their 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 consciousness. It's jamming them. So that that could be some sort of, um, you know, it's what I've been saying is maybe the way I look at the Mandel effect is we're kind of because some of us don't see the changes at the same time. We don't agree on all. Of them. We know that. I mean, we agree to a detail on like probably eighty percent of them. Whatever. We know how it goes, but. I feel almost like as if it's frequencies permeating us sometimes at different times. These people, because of their cognitive dissonance or whatever it is, we know that they would recognize the changes because we remember what, what they, they remember what we do when we test them on it. But their cognitive dissonance blocks blocks out seeing it for whatever reason. But there's another I look at it almost like there's this other frequency, the the disinformation and update frequency. And we can kind of see it and just fend it off, and they kind of just take it. They just take that update. They take it right in front of you. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you almost know you you can predict what they're going to do next when they take that update. Can you give us an example of a story and what Mandel effect and who you brought it up to? Um, okay, let me think. Uh, who was it recently? Um. Oh boy, that's a, there's been so many. I'm trying to find one that's especially entertaining. <laughs> um, oh. mm. Let's see, uh, what would be a good one? Um, well, the lion and the lamb. That one, I've had several people when I've talked to them about that one. Um, the, you know, they immediately go to the translation. It's another translation. Yeah. So you go through all those steps with them. You get to them to the point where there's no other option but that it's changed. And they all have that last resort thing that clicks in, you know, um, and it's usually not rational. You know, it's, it's, um, uh, you know, they it's go either, with well, I'm getting the pair, I'm, I'm getting Aesop's parable confused, something yeah. like that. You know what I mean? Like it won't yeah. even make sense. But it's yeah. enough for them to dismiss it and be cool again. Now they don't have to even ever think about this again. It is so disturbing to them. And th there is another possibility here. And this I got some messages about um, over a period of a couple years from Sam. And, and, and I'm just going to put this. I'm not going to get real specific because these are very deep things we're talking about here. Um, you know, when you get into this deep depth of spirituality, especially when suffering is involved, it's, you know, it's, 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 you, you know, you, you, you want to explain it in the right way and, um, without going into too much, but he kept sending me the song memory and the way we were the memory. So my feeling is that we existed before we came here and that memory is what we can't that that is the issue 
It's that we're suffering from some sort of cosmic amnesia. And all the mind games and the mind control here, all of the fault, you know, the false flags and staged events, all the trauma-based mind control, all the deceptions, all the mockery, all of that is to keep us from just basically remembering who we are. You know, that we forgot this, that it's been buried for it's something, something took the memory away. And that's the sense. So if, if say whatever it was that happened before we came here is so painful that we can't handle remembering it and it's our own consciousness fighting that memory, because perhaps we're here and we're suffering because maybe, maybe we made a wrong decision. Maybe we did something that, you know, that got us in a pickle or something. Maybe we were beings who descended into a lower realm of consciousness by some mistake or error or something, you know, whatever it is. So that's the other thing I think about, you know, and I, and I asked him one time, I said, what do you mean about the memory? And he played the way we were, which is the Barbra Streisand song from the film back in the seventies with Robert Redford. It was a love story. And there's a line in the song where it says, uh, What's too painful to remember, we simply choose to forget. So yeah. I, that's one of the things I pray for, is that my memory be restored. That if I was aware before I came here and was born in this body at that, in 1967, if I had some beginning before that, I want to remember it. You know, I want to know what it was, what happened, yeah. you know. But I do feel that this is almost like a scripted story we're in, because when you start putting the Mandela effect together with the synchronicities, the numbers, people questioning, I mean, everything, even are we on a sphere? Are we on a flat sphere? Everything is, 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 it's like we woke up with, with, and, and we're discovering it ourselves for the first time. Like no one's told us what it is. We, we, we have to just do it ourselves now. We have to figure this out and use our, our ingenuity and our, our, cre you know, our imaginations and, and piece this together. So, so that's the other thing I've thought about, the updates and, and the, 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 the hostility sometimes um, that people you know, exhibit when you first talk to them. But I have noticed I don't get the hostility as much anymore. That's kind of, that was only about the first year, real bad. Do you still? No, I don't the get the hostility as much. Mm -hmm. Is has your approach changed, or you still use the same approach and you just get less? Well, people? I think I'm probably that's probably a lot to do with it. You're right, Brian. I think I'm less nervous when I talk to somebody now than I was the first few times. <laughs> you know, yeah. my heart would be pounding. Um, what do you open up with? So what maybe you, what do you open up with? What do you open up with usually? I know because here's the thing with the Mandela effect. So obviously. I mean, I'm kind of answering the question already, but obviously it, it's in every facet of life. So you can pick something that resonates with everybody. But yeah. it, if you were just in a general room with people you, you've known your whole life, family members, cousins, the, friends. The two that I would, yeah, the, the two I would start off with would be uh, Mr. Rogers theme song. Everyone knows that no matter what age they are, usually, except maybe yeah. younger, younger kids. Um, and yeah. then I, uh, the, the scarecrow, Scarecrow having the gun. Mm -hmm. And those are the two I'll okay. usually put in first. And then I'll go with Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. He will come. See, that's the thing, Brian. He will come. Well, who's he? If these are messages, are we yeah. being prepared for something? I mean, I wonder sometimes, is someone coming into this realm that is going to physically appear? that we're going to be interacting with. Is that what all this is about? Is this the pre-notice <laughs> that something magnificent is coming? It could be. Well, let me ask you know, your opinion. And it, What's your opinion on Tom Hanks and all his connections to all these effects? Does he know? Do these actors in general know? Do a select few know? Do none of them know? Uh, what do you think? Because my opinion. Yeah, Hanks that's a, that's a hard one for me. Well, when, when Suzanne Summers, her name, as I remembered, it was S O M M E R S. I worked at a talent agency and we represented uh, a lot of actors. And I, so I knew her name for projects that were coming up or whatever. 
Um, so when I saw her name became S-O-M-E-R-S, I started to wonder who Suzanne Summers was. <laughs> you know, like, is yeah. this a real person? Is she a projection? Is she an artificial intelligence hologram in a, overlaid into our reality? Because she, her name just changed and she doesn't know it. You know, is this being tipped off to people here who aren't exactly real and we're being fooled by them? You know, um, so I, so when I look at Tom Hanks, mm -hmm. I wonder the same thing. Is he part of the program or if he is, because I've never met him in person, but, you know, can these projections look so real? Is there, a, you know, um, I, or is it being scripted and he's not even aware of it? Mm -hmm. Like, are these people really their own? sovereign beings or are they puppets under something else the system um so that you know and 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 for me it's it's really complicated because i've worked with actors who are on television who've done plays of mine very well known actors you would know if i said their name and i've been with them at their weddings and and having dinner with them and so they're real so <laughs> so i know they're real so are they real in the same way Tom Hanks is? I don't know. It's it's really it's a mind it's a mind bender. I mean, we're having to think in ways we've never thought before, right? Yeah, it really is. You, you know what Mandela effects? I really like you know, because we could go ahead. Were you gonna say? No, no. Go ahead. Well, I mean, like when you try to introduce this to people. And say say people that say not people the first time like at a family gathering, but say like on Facebook, right? And I know you'll resonate with this. So there's people right. that have kind of been looking at conspiracies a little bit or whatever, and they've heard a couple of the you know the bit Berenstein and C3PO. They heard a couple of them over the last year or two, but they never really delved into it. Um, I think it's really good to go at them with the historical changes. Um, what are some of the big historical changes for you? Because I know there must be many. Yeah, well. Black Tom, like you say, but one of the ones for me that's personally a big one is one of the, I guess they're calling them inventions before their time. And yeah. because my dad was a musician and had been in a rockabilly band in the 60s, and we always had, you know, we had the eight track in our car and all that. If Brian, if there had existed vinyl single record players in cars in the 60s, oh my God. My yeah. father would have had it. So that that is a historical uh, thing that never existed in my reality. And that's and in this reality, that's now part of the history. But see, that's what doesn't make sense because he didn't have one. So that's why I always thought these are changes being inserted into the reality. Um, but it doesn't necessarily change the, the, the human being's reality or history. It's like, it's, it's like whatever this, this is around us, whatever the nature of this reality is, it's almost like it's separate from us. Because it is separate from us. The reality around us is the devil's trick and the illusion, the yeah. matrix, I believe. And we're trying to get our souls yeah. out of here. What we're trying to do. We're and the only real things right. here. You yeah. Know, that's, you know, that's, that's the stunning here. conclusion. Yeah. You know, yeah. we may be the only thing that's actually real here is us. Everything else could be a complete illusion. Yep. So I think that's why it's important to, you know, really get find find some connection with something that is that you feel is home or that's calling to you and really get on that frequency because um I think we're being called home. I do. I think this is a this is an incredible experience. Um, and, and see, and this was the other thing and why I'm hopeful, uh, because during the near-death experience, one thing that he showed me was a future scene. I cannot, now the memory of exactly what he showed me has been taken. I only remember the very end of it, the night scene and the trees and the stars and a gathering of a lot of people and the joy and the love and the, the celebration, I can't even describe it. That I remember my emotional reaction to what he showed me. And I remember saying, that is so beautiful. Why don't I remember that? Because at this point, I think I've died 
and maybe I'm getting a past life view. I mean, a past, you know, like, you know, when I was, cause I did, he did show me myself in my crib when I was a baby with my mother. I remember that. So, and then he showed me, me as a 22 year old looking at my mother and her, her casket when she died. So he like showed me that those two moments were similar, that they were meaningful. They meant something and that he was trying to get me to see it. So, you know, that, that experience, um, you know, was, was, was very deep and, uh, I'd lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> have have you had any um personal changes around you now i know you have you know you talk about that um you know the record play oh i know i know what yeah. it was i just to finish that last thought i'm sorry um what he what he was and then what he said to me was that hasn't that hasn't happened that's the future so that's when i knew something was coming that was going to be amazing and that whatever this is that we're going through the ending is going to be incredible, you know, and we yeah. just have to stay strong and centered and support each other. Um, if this goes on a long time, Brian, I don't see how we're going to be able to tolerate these people. And I mean that as loving as I can say it. I know it's going to be well, intolerable to be people who live in that false reality and we see it and they can't. I think we're going to have to have a breakaway civilization if we have to continue here for a lot longer, which I don't think is what's going to happen. I think the time is coming when, when the transitions are going to happen yeah. and, you know, um, yeah, we're going to I see the truth. Somebody, you know? somebody asked me the other day and I, you know, I went and said like X amount of years. I, I don't even think it's going to be like five or six years, honestly. Well, I'm getting 2024. You know, I'm getting the, the solar, solar eclipse that year. Is uh, April eighth. Yeah. yeah. And you know what's interesting about that? If you've done any research on it, those two eclipses. The. Go ahead. What about the eclipse? Uh, the two thousand seventeen, the two thousand seventeen solar eclipse, and the two thousand twenty four are seven years apart, give or take a little mm -hmm. couple months. And they make an X across the United States of America. And the center point is Makanda, Illinois. And Makanda, Illinois is also called the Star of Egypt. That's a very interesting thing coming up. So I, I have a feeling that within the next four years, we're really going to move fast uh, in this awakening. Um, I, 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 it's, you know, it's, it's on. It's going to be on like Donkey Kong. <laughs> As they yeah, say. Well, what do you think about the um well and i know you said you saw it early early on the disinformation i mean what do you think about the disinformation lately it's in high gear is it is it is it not i mean are they in panic mode or what are yeah they, the mines the plant is yeah, peanut because, guy? What, what is it yeah. you know Go ahead. okay so so they've been watching us i'll tell you one of my my it may be controversial what i'm gonna say but <laughs> they've been watching us so where we were the year they came ahead of the and 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 uh, made that X Files episode on the Mandela effect, where we were at that time, is very different from where we are right now. So they're observing us. They've been watching us in this process. How much we know. How how quickly we we disable the the misinformation. Um, and so where we went from the mockery of the X Files the ridicule and mockery, and then we get taken off in the straight jacket like a crazy person at the end. That won't work now. Now they have to pull out the fear. They have to threaten. They have to show Mandela affected people in this Criminal Minds episode, which was criminal. I mean, they're telling you who they are that put that show out. They're criminals. And that's yeah. their criminal mind. They do things like that. So it's very revealing. They're, so what they're all doing, they're outing themselves. I really believe that. I think everything has to be revealed. We have to see all the deceptions, how it works. So we will never be tricked again. I think that once we're through this, there is no way we will ever be deceived again. It can't happen. <laughs> if we can get through this one, you know, with our mm -hmm. truth still in, 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 in our hearts, then that's saying something. So the fact that they had him decapitating people, see, in decapitation, the um, 
it causes for people who are seeing it or witnessing it, and this is this is research on this, it actually causes a hallucinogenic effect on the human mind to witness that mm -hmm. of all the horrible scenes you can see. So they chose that. What that shows me is just how wicked these people are. Yeah. They Man, are I, beyond I really what I could even imagine. They're not even human when they do something like that. That's not human. I don't know human beings who do that or think that way. I don't know. I can't imagine people that even watch it. So, so for them to do that, it shows they're afraid of where we are right now. They have some warriors now that have channels and they're scared. And believe me, you're on their radar, I'm sure. But see, they can't stop it. They can only, I no. think, slow it down. And that's what this is. They're trying to buy more time. Um, they do not want to relinquish control. And, you know, um, and I've thought about this too. You know, the fact that they're fighting. See, the fact that they have to go to the, this trouble to mess with our heads and to keep us under this mind control. It's like in the Wizard of Oz where Glenn, uh, with the Wicked Witch wants the ruby slippers and she tries to take them and it repels her and shocks her. And she realizes that Dorothy has to give them to her. She can't just take them. And I think that's what this is. Whatever they want from us spiritually, they can't take. We have to give it. So, mm -hmm. and our consciousness, I think, is so powerful that it could, for all we know, our consciousness, once we had the hundredth monkey and we were all thinking the same thing about this place, it could dissolve right in front of us to nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we would be standing where we really exist. You know, the dream would be over. So um, I, 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 I'm, I see it as positive. They're ramping it up. They're running scared. Um, and, and I think that they, they realize the time is short. Well, they absolutely realize, and I've been saying it lately a lot. They definitely monitor what's going on with people talking about this. I've definitely seen direct reactions to some of the stuff I put out, and I'm sure they've had direct reactions to other people before me and after me and many more right. because, they, of course, they're watching. That's what they do. That's why they put up the Internet and YouTube and made it so – you know, YouTube and Facebook, they, they got so popular because they were made user-friendly. So it was really easy to get hooked on it. And then they, what they did is they centralized the whole internet. You know what I mean? Because people were wandering off right, in different right. forms and stuff too much unregulated. So they centralized everything. And then they can just pull the rug out when they want and scatter everybody about. Everybody will reform again and recopy, but that gives them more time. You know what I mean? They know what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, they data collect, so they have to find out what we're thinking, how we're reacting to what they're doing. They, they, that's their only, you know, so they're constantly, so, but I think in this case, it backfired on them a little bit. I don't think they thought that we would do what we did. I think we took them by surprise. So now, of course, they're starting to censor and that kind of thing. But what, what they really do is they use our family and friends to be the Smiths. They're really the gatekeepers, mm -hmm. the guards at the at the you know palace, if you want to say, you know they're they're so they get the people themselves to be the gatekeepers, you know, and that's that's who the mind control is really going for. That's why they did criminal minds the other night. They need to make sure that their that our friends and family saw that, and will be very discouraging of this very fearful, maybe talk about, maybe you need to go get on some antipsychotic medication. Are you like that guy in the, you know, that's what they're going to think a lot of them. I know. You know? So, I know. so I know. that, that, you know, but it shows you the nature of, of, of this consciousness that we're dealing with here that does this. I mean, this is, it's wretched, <laughs> you know, I mean, it needs to be stopped. We have to stop it. You know, and we obviously have some help <laughs> and they can't do anything about it. They can just try to cover it up and insert or do whatever they can do, their tricks. Um, but but this, I believe that the Mandela effect is is their worst nightmare. It's their greatest fear, you know, and they've done a good job for a long time. I mean, you know, hiding it because I believe this has been going on for a long, long time, you know, yeah, and, well, and I do think there's some sort of. Yeah. Go ahead. 
Oh, the modernator said they want our souls. Yeah. No, they do. I and, think and so. The reason they're so they're so fearful of this is because we're gonna we're realizing the nature of this realm and this illusion, and they do. They want to keep our souls trapped here. That's what it's all about. So they're trying to do everything to d discredit this. I mean, they really. I have never seen something so strong with with disinformation and hatred and, and evil as that criminal minds thing. I was like. Wow, like I've seen them label 9-11 truthers and flat earthers and all everybody is crazy and, and you know all this stuff, but it's like I've never seen anybody labeled as an axe murderer that kills people in front of their children and decapitates them so they can bring chopped heads down to a cave, talk to a baphomet looking goat rabbit type thing <laughs> so you can take their heads back and jump timelines back to before their son died too. Because that's the other thing too. It's either you know that it's either uh it, 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 it's always a traumatic event too, like in the movie, you know, and in this, it's because their kid died. So that's why they see the Mandela effect as well. It's like ridiculous. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it's so over, it was so over the top and extreme. I, I couldn't even believe I was seeing what I was seeing. I mean, they outdid themselves, but it also showed me they are so scared. They are in big trouble. If this is what they've got to do now, I mean, really push the credibility. I mean, an intelligent person is going to see that and see through it, I think. Um, I hope. You know. Yeah, we hope. I hope, man. I so hope. I will tell you on the good side of things, I'm I just finished a new play. Um, and mm -hmm. I the Mandela effect features prominently in it. So it, and I'm, you know, if I can get the play produced, I think that will introduce people to the effect in a way that's positive and not negative. I think if there are any artists or writers in this community, we need to start using our work uh, to get the message out about this. And if you're a good writer, you can put it in a way that's interesting to an audience without having it be like you're preaching them, you know, preaching to them or trying to convert them or something. Um, and so I, I, I sent it to my agent and his suggestion is, cause it's a long play. It's a six hour play, um, uh, seen in two parts. You'd go see it in two different parts. Um, and he has a friend at Netflix. So what we've talked about doing, and I'm going to start working on this, I'm working on this now, I'm going to write the story as a 10 episode, one hour Netflix series. Um, because my agent has a friend that works there at Netflix and he thinks that this would make a great TV series. So if I, and I, and I have a producer involved, a friend who I would like to produce and some actors I'd like to pull in. So Ryan, if I can do this, millions of people will see the Mandela effect for what it really is. That'd be awesome. Now, whether they ever allow that on the TV or not, will you know, remains to be seen, but I am definitely going to try it. Because, you know, I don't know how else to fight except to be creative and do what I can do to help and get the word out. Yeah, and I, I mean, when, that's, the, that's the that's the outlet that you have. Use it. I mean, you know what I mean? I can't I don't have access to that. Other people don't. You have access to that. Exploit it as much you can and get the message out there. If that's how you can do it. You know what I mean? So we'll basically, basically how I introduce it, this character, he's the world's leading expert on the Wizard of Oz. So he sees the scarecrow's gun and he sees the changes in Glinda's dialogue, you know, uh, uh, from click your heels three times to tap your heels. So within the story, this is what aw awakens him. He realizes something has happened. This is his favorite movie. He's, he's an expert. He's written books about it, you know, so that so we see someone who's credible you know, that's a sane person. This character is going to be a, uh, a playwright. You know, I'm using sort of my, so I can sort of tell some of my story in it, but make it a fictional thing so that when people see it, they're, they're seeing a fictional story. They won't, you know, you know, I think I can, I can do a good job that way so that people don't get defensive. I don't think the cognitive dissonance goes up as much when it's fictional, you know, as in when you're talking to somebody, you know, and you're telling them, yeah. you know, that, uh, you know, depends oh, is now depends. Every hour. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and I have a I have a, a little theory why uh, if if and now this is this is my opinions that I'm sharing. This is just my the way I see it, the way I 
you know, personalize what's going on. Um, but I, I think that Sam change depends to depend because when, when, when what goes down is about to happen, I think people are going to need some depends because they're going to shit their pants. I just think, <laughs> Brian, I think we haven't yeah. seen anything yet. And I'm going to tell you something else that I think is coming. When we hear these end of the world scenarios, whether it's the book of Revelation or, you know, the ancient Vedas and all the all the stories about they're always really scary. You know, they're very dramatic. There's earthquakes and volcanoes and all of that. But I have a feeling that whatever's coming may actually be funny and comical. And we can all go out laughing, which would be of great relief, <laughs> you know, because this place is too yeah. damn heavy. It's too heavy here. I can't take this place anymore. You know, I'm tired of it. I'm, I'm going on 53, but I feel like I'm 108. I am so tired, you know, of this place. And once you see it for what it is and you realize it's all a lie and a deception, it is very hard to be here, you know, um, and some people can't take it. You know, but I hope they hang on. I asked Sam, what's the most important thing? He said, staying alive. We need to stay in our bodies. You know, as bad as it gets, you know, stay in your body. You know, reach out, ask for help if you need it. You know, um, if you're dealing with isolation or whatever, if you're dealing with addiction or self-harming, there's help. You know, um, so, you know, we, we just need to really stay close to each other. Because I think, uh, like I said, I think it's it's through us that this is going to manifest. We're obviously the ones that have been contacted for a reason. We're going to be needed, you know? And so um, I, I'm, I'm really hopeful, but I do think what's coming is going to maybe be funny because some of the changes are funny, you know, some of the yeah. changes are pretty comical. If you think about it, you know, they're, they're just ridiculous. Some of them. So maybe we're being shown a little bit of the sense of humor of the intelligence that's doing it. You know, um, wow. What are, what are some of the biggest changes for you that we haven't talked about? Oh, well, I'll tell you one that happened the other night, and this was real interesting. It's the Stevie Nicks song, Wild Heart. My friend um, mm -hmm. who lives up in New York, he came down recently and we were talking, and uh, he's a huge Stevie Nicks fan. He knows every song by heart. I mean, there's he's the expert on her, her music. And he was, he sent me the video of the song with the, the lyrics. And for some reason, something said, and this is the other thing I've noticed. If you, we are all having intuition now, we're all having a gut oh, yeah. feeling to do something or research something or look at a certain video. Yep. We have to trust that that is guidance. That is some sort of yep. higher guidance coming to us in the soul telling us it's showing us a path. It's showing us a way out to where we need to get to. So I agree. So, so when he sent me the the video, I thought, okay, I've got there's going to be a change in the song. I know it. I knew it. So it got to the line where she sing where the person who did the lyrics wrote of your mind, but she's clearly singing in your mind at this point in the song. Now the rest of the song, she continues to sing of your mind. So when I went and looked at the published lyrics online. It also had that discrepancy where it says of, but not in. So the published lyrics and the person who did the video heard it of your mind, where now she's singing in your mind. So I, you know, I didn't prompt him. I wrote it, you know, in a, in a message and I said, fill in the blank uh, and the whole line. I forgot now what it, what it was, but, and he remembered of your mind. Mm -hmm. So I said to him, I said, well, go play it now and see if this is what you remember. And it was really amazing. And that's a tiny, tiny change. But that's something that meant something to him. That's something he knew. I have yeah. another friend who is a huge Cher fan. And mm -hmm. he contacted, because he didn't never, never responded to any of my Mandela Effect stuff. And I put a lot of Mandela Effect stuff on Facebook, um, you know, along yeah. with my whatever I'm doing, my plays or whatever. And, um, uh, he is a big fan of the share share has been his whole life, especially her variety show in the seventies. And he sent me a note and he said, sh the opening share logo in her TV series has changed. 
Now, that is something hardly anyone in the world would ever notice, but he noticed it. That change was for him. Mm -hmm. I think there's a change with every single person's name on it. (laughs) And and everyone is going to have their turn. That's my hope. Yeah, my... Well, I mean, I had a whole neighborhood change, but um, I, I mean, I already knew about the effect for years, so I didn't need that to convince me. But yeah, I, de- I definitely feel that uh, that's funny. And you know what's what's Why what I like about the music ones, dude? What's up? No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll ask you afterwards. <clears throat> yeah, you know what I like, like how we say, um, you know, uh, the music ones, right? Those are beautiful to get with mm-hmm. people with. People resonate with music. They have very strong anchor memories based on music, specifically like where they were when they played a certain song. You know what I mean? So if those songs have lyrics right. that's changed, it's very easy. I have a very high success rate uh, really tripping people up with any Mandela's, but especially the music ones. I mean, it's so easy. And some of them really, just, they're just so crazy. Like you want to talk about messages in, in songs. How about Jules, who will save your soul now says, who will save your souls? Like, what's all that about, you know? That's crazy. Exactly. Now, see, now, in in the fact that the title itself didn't alter, just what she's singing, mm-hmm. that doesn't even make sense. You know, if you have to really be closed to not see this, that's why I think there's almost some force other than these human beings that's ca- keeping them from seeing it. That's 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 holding their consciousness in a place where they can't conceive this is even possible. Because we see it, I mean, you, 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 you know, that was the song, and I've used that with several people. One friend actually, it was the talent show we were doing here to raise some money for an organization, and she wanted to do karaoke of the song. So mm-hmm. she sang "Soul." I waited, and then it was over. I took mm-hmm. her aside and I said, "Hey, um, this that how you remember the song?" She's like, "Yeah." I said, "Well, listen to it now." And I got she got her headphones on, and she was she was shocked. You know, absolutely yeah. shocked that it had changed, but I never really got an update after that, you know, so that'll happen. Sometimes you'll get someone, but then they never bring it up again. It's almost like they forgot about it, you know, that it's like been removed yeah. from their memory. So I don't know if, if, if that's what's happening, but the, the music ones, you know, pretend to pray. That was a big one for me. Um, yeah, that was a major one. Um, and then there's silly ones like like Magic by Pilot, which was a me and my brother in 1974. We had the single, uh, you know, and I remember the beginning. Whoa, 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 it's magic, you know, and that's and I asked my friend last night, my other friend. What is uh, it now? What is it now? It's now. Oh, ho, ho. Now that changed around Christmas time a couple years ago. And I posted it on Facebook at the time. As soon as I heard on the radio, I thought, oh, wow, they did like a Christmas version. It's like, oh, ho, ho, because it was Christmas time. Yeah. And when I went on, you know, (laughs) so I, you know, so if you're a good researcher, you're going to do your research. So that's what I did. I got home. I found out, no, there was only one version of that song. And they're now singing, oh, ho, ho, like they're Santa Claus come to town. And it's called magic. You know, so to me, these are all messages. You know, and and I think I don't know. I just have the feeling when the time comes, the only thing we're taking out of here is ourselves, you know, and that um, whatever attachments we have, whatever belief systems, I think we we may have to just get naked, you know, just just be just our our own self without all the baggage, you know, um, because the Bible changes that are happening. You know, I know there are Christian people who are extremely upset with what's happening there, that it's a sacrilege or it's vulgar or whatever. Um, But I think it's trying to free us. You know, I mean, it's, I sometimes think about, you know, if you get in a canoe and you go to an island, when you get to the island, you get out of the canoe and you go across the island, you don't carry the canoe with you on your back. Once you get to the island, you don't need the canoe. Yeah. So are we going to be at the point where we're not going to need any of these books either? Because we'll have the real thing. We'll have we'll have it, whatever that is, whatever these books were trying to tell us. will be there, you know, and we don't need to carry it with us anymore. You know, we can be free in that in whatever that moment is. So 
this is what the kind of stuff I think about, you know, I, I, to me, this is a very deep thing. And, um, Oh, very deep. Well, look how and, much attention I, I spend and how much time I spend on it. And I've been through a lot of deep, deep topics. I mean, nine 11 flat earth. I mean, these are huge, huge things. And this is happening right now. Seeing physical reality change, the whole construct of what time is, is out the window now with this as well. I mean, everything's it's, 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 it's such a game changer. In time itself, speeding up. I mean, I remember as a kid, one, one thousand, two, one thousand. I and I remember the 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 speed I set it at. I can't say it that slow now without the second passing quicker. You know, it, I mean, by the time I get to ten, it's already eighteen. Yeah. So I know time has sped up. Um. So that that's that's incredible. You know, I mean, just just what we're seeing. There's something going on here, and uh, you know, and and and. I'm, you know, so at the moment when we're really uh, uh, opening ourselves up to whatever this this communication is that we're we're receiving it, we're getting the signals, we understand. We're we're I think we're activating parts of our brain we've never used. Yep. You know, I have the sense that maybe our DNA is actually changing in this conscious. We know the internal organs do move places, change locations, and it does it instantaneously. Yeah. So, so, you know, Cynthia Sue Larson always says, how good can it get? You know, and I think that's true. I think, I, I think, I don't think we've seen anything yet, but I think we have the opposition. So it looks like everything's chaos, you know, but I think all of that has to happen for us to go where we're going. I think the whole thing has to come down the whole system, the whole lie, you know, the whole charade. And um, and perhaps that's why we've we're awake to this now. So when the moment does come and our family and friends then need to talk, we're there for them. They'll come to us first to find out what this is. So perhaps we're the first responders, <laughs> you know, to quote something from your history, your research. Um, yeah. The real first responders that, you know, are going to be there to help out because Hey, if, if I, and I, you know, if people can't take fruit loops changing, they're in, they're in for a big shock. <laughs> I mean, that's nothing. I mean, this, whatever is doing these changes could change anything. It's just holding back right now. I mean, what's yeah. the difference between, between changing, you know, uh, uh, you know, lion and lamb or, 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 oh, you know, another one that's funny to me is cap and crunch. That's yeah. hysterical to me. There was no way it didn't say. I mean, when we were kids, we'd look at that cereal and we'd look at the box. It was Captain. That's how we learned the word Captain. Yeah. I, I mean, Captain is not even the abbreviation of Captain. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> it's yeah. so ridiculous. The abbreviation Captain is CP period, not not C yeah. I don't know what it is. So it doesn't even make sense. How these people that you know, Brian, these people that seem to be intelligent in every way, how they cannot see this is beyond me. It blows my mind. Very well educated, bright people, and they can't see there's something wrong with liquid plumber being spelled P L M R. You wouldn't do that in advertising in the 50s. They didn't have ghetto spelling then. <laughs> you know, the tidy bowl. The way that's spelled is so jacked up. I mean, if you have any logical sense, you can see that's wrong. That it's almost like it's so extreme. It's like a joke. <laughs> well, the fonts of all, even the fonts that they didn't have back then that they use in like with the upside down A's and all this shit. I mean, the upside down V's that are representing A's, you know what I mean? Like they didn't use all that back then. All no, no. And I did tell you that I had uh, a, a, I told you on the phone, I guess it was, was it earlier today or yesterday? Uh, now, I guess uh, that I had a, 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 a word in my play, my published script that changed. So that was a personal thing for me. You know, um, the word was moon in the script. And when I went to see a production of it in Florida, the actress said the word stars. So I went backstage and I asked her about it. And I said, why did you change the line? I said, I actually prefer stars. It sounds better the way you said it. And she said, no, I didn't change it. That's in the script. So I got home and I pulled out the script and I could not believe it. 
I had seen 12, 15 productions before this, and it was always Moon. And the published script was 2008, was the, the date that it was published, the year. So I called three other actresses that had also done the role, and they all remembered Moon. They did not remember stars. So I feel the more you invite this in, that, that you don't aren't afraid or fight it off or are scared or run from it or get all the fear porn around it, is as long as you come at it with curiosity and 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 wonder and amazement, it will play with you. It will talk to you back in personal ways. I I see it every day. Yeah. I agree. The hard part is knowing what is the good force that's communicating and what's the negative interference. You know, that takes I some think concern. I think, yeah, well, for me, it's kind of clear. I mean, for me, the good force is the changes. And, and we're meant to see the changes. And the bad side of it is everything that's done to make us doubt it. So that's yeah. human intervention with the new backstories that are released, the new videos on Black Tom and all this stuff to reinforce new reality. You know, the Grammy performance with Mr. Rogers, uh, theme song with this, and Mr. Peanut. That's all new reality reinforcement. That's all man-made. Okay, that men can do that. But then again, the other stuff, the backstories inserted into the timeline, that has to be supernatural. So, you know, for me, that's that's the clear difference between the good and the evil. The stuff to make us doubt the changes and accept the new reality, that's all the evil side, all of it. And the stuff that, it, you know, us actually seeing the changes, the changes themselves, for me, that's the good side. That's what I think. As far and as I it, agree. I agree that, completely. Yeah, yeah I, have, I have felt that from the beginning. That, and, it, and you know what, Brian? The more simple the explanation, the probably closer to the mm -hmm. truth it is. These really oh. complicated, confusing narratives are probably not the truth. It's probably as simple as you just stated it. But see, they're going to want to make you doubt everything. They're even putting out disinformation articles now about synchronicity, not trusting the synchronicity that it's uh, an evil force trying to trick you. By creating synchronicity. I don't believe that. I think that's a lie. That's too complicated. I think if it's a synchronicity, it's it is that higher intelligence trying to get your attention. That's my personal opinion from what I've witnessed. I I think I saw I man, I was just when you know, I put that Neil deGrasse thing out earlier. I think he had just had a video about, you know, dismissing synchronicity and all that. these people mm -hmm. are so against humanity, it's unbelievable. At the but, same yeah, time they try to tell us we're in a simulation in a computer somewhere. Yeah. And I don't know how people don't see that agenda. I mean, these same people that lie to us about everything, they all come out and tell us that we're in a simulation and, or in a computer. or it's, And these things, again, they're all to separate you from God. They're all to separate you from the creator. They're all to make you feel insignificant. That's what the, always their agenda is. You know, see, yes. And because the last thing in the world they want us to do is to connect the Mandela effect, the changes we're witnessing in the physical reality to a higher power, a divine, benevolent, loving force, intelligence. That they cannot have. So that being can exist, number one, there is no magic. We will give you the reality we want you to have, you know, and, and do everything they can to keep that cord severed to keep that connection from happening and i think that's why we we suffer from addictions depression suicide illness hopelessness you know i if if a flower doesn't bloom you don't change the flower you change the environment the flower is trying to grow in that's us i think i don't think there's anything wrong with us except where we are this is the place we're at is the problem you know, we're trying to grow in toxic soil here. And so no wonder the world's in the shape it's in. You can't, ha you can't live in a lie and be healthy. 
So it comes out in all these weird manifestations, depression, um, compulsive behaviors, overeating, sugar addictions, drug, alcohol, ev all of that stuff. You know, peep sex addiction. People are trying to cope the best they can, get lost in the religion, you know, become become very, you know, rigid and, and, and cling real tightly to what I believe and I need to believe because this is what I've been told. This is the way I feel. And I'll be honest about all of it, including the Bible. And this will probably upset a lot of people. But I don't trust anything we got from anyone in this realm when it comes to who God is. I don't. I know what they lie. I know how they lie. Why would that be protected from deception when everything else is full of it? It doesn't make any logical sense to me. I think it's like everything. There's beauty and truth in all of these things, but there's also a lot of deception and you got to be able to discern, you know, maybe that's why we're going through this. So we, we hone that skill as conscious beings. We, we, we will come to a place where we'll never be fooled again and deceived, you know, that we will understand what the lie is and how we contribute to it. You know, like I decided a few years ago, I wasn't going to lie anymore. That's hard. Mm -hmm. That is so hard. Even, you know, on a, just when I don't want to do something and I want to come up with an excuse, so I don't have to go and do something I don't want to do that kind of lie. That's easier to be able to just say a lie, you know, doctor's appointment, you know what I mean? But I realized, wait a minute, if I'm asking for truth in the external world, I got to, I have to have it myself. I can't lie about this stuff anymore, even a little lie. I have to tell the truth here because if I am, I otherwise I'm make, I'm, I'm consenting to the lie out in the outer world and the outer reality. I'm playing a part in making that possible. So I think what our thoughts are and what we do each day, I think is very important. And I do believe every single person has been called to something important that we're going to do. And trying to figure what that is, is, is tough sometimes, you know. Um, but I, I think there is strength in numbers. And just pay attention to everything and question everything, you know. And, um, and, I, and I, I think we're, 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 we're getting close. I just, I have a feeling 2020 is going to be a big year too, you know. Mm -hmm. there, I feel like the changes and it's all um, accelerating. There was a yeah. period where it seemed like a year where nothing was really happening. You remember? It was kind of quiet. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, boom. This yeah, thing. from like maybe maybe like mid-2017 to mid-2018, it kind of slowed down a bit. And then the summer 2018, it picked back up, I think. At See, least we, you know, we don't know, you know, Brian, there could be one person that hasn't awoken yet to this that we're all waiting to get for them to see it. It could just be one person away from where we're, where we, what we need to, to really break through this thing in a big way. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and so at any moment that could happen. And I do feel like we're going to see bigger changes coming. I really do. The more of us that there are, the more of us that are awake and can handle it. And it's not going to crack our psyche. You know, I think that's, you know, you have to understand too, if you're the being making the changes to free these these souls or this consciousness that's in this lower realm and suffering, you have to be very careful how you do it. It's very delicate because you don't want to shatter the consciousness through shock. So I think, a, you know, people always say, well, why doesn't it change? Why don't they change something? Why doesn't something big change? I think that's why it's, it's, it's like when you dive down and you're coming up from the water, you can't come up too fast. It'll kill you. And yeah. I think that might be what it is, why the changes are so benign and subtle so that those of us who are closer to awakening can go ahead and get ready for when those larger changes start to happen. And, and we can sort of support that. That That's my feeling, um, you know, that things are going to happen and that that. You know, but 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 then I could be wrong, you know, but I do feel this is leading to something. This isn't just. Uh, going to just keep going this way indefinitely. No, I agree. Right? I mean, there's been times when I felt like I'm like literally spiritually got one foot out the door and it's made me like emotional just thinking about it, talking about it. This whole other feeling comes over me and I don't know 
is I'll break out in tears. And I don't know, it's not sadness. It's not happiness. It's kind of happiness, but it's like, it's kind of this other emotion. I think it's a lot to do with like, we know our time here is almost done, but there's also that other emotion where what's going to happen to our loved ones that aren't ready to wake up? What are they going to do? What do you think? Are they going to stay here and repeat? Is a repeating mm -hmm. test? You know, mm -hmm. ready to get out of here because i kind of think of it as um you said it's like a script and i believe it's kind of like god choose your own adventure book if you know what those are choose your own oh yeah yeah definitely i feel it's like that and these other people that don't see the changes and whatnot they just kind of go with the flow completely while we make conscious decisions at the end of each chapter to kind of get out of here what's your what's your opinion on the people that don't see the changes as we go on to the next realm or whatever, what are they going to be left doing? Well, you know, I've thought about this a lot too. And I think I would, I would ask you this question because I think it's it tells you how I think about it. If God were to say to you right now, okay, Brian, you have a choice. You can either leave this realm mm -hmm. now and be done with it. All the deception, all the suffering, all the insanity, all of that that's going on. Or, you can stay here and help me turn this into a paradise mm -hmm. where you continue here, but not like it was. It'll be a new creation, a new way to live with peace and serenity and the, and the, and the boogeyman will be gone. You know, what would you say? Which would you choose? I would stay and help knowing what I know now and knowing there's a lot of people that can't see yet. I would feel that my job probably isn't done. And I think that each person will probably get to have that decision. We'll have to make maybe a similar decision for though, you know, um, I would make the same decision you did because it would mean being able to free them all here. And that was the other thing I asked Sam one time it was late one night and I was laying in bed and I just, in my own mind, you know, I don't say these out loud. I just said, what is, what is the objective of our mission? What is, what is, what what is the objective here and he played the song no one gets left behind and it was from the soundtrack album of the movie little miss sunshine and it has the little family trying to get into the volkswagen there's your volkswagen <laughs> yeah you know yellow volkswagen van like the one we had when we were kids that's another big one for me vw because we had my dad only bought vws when we were kids we had a van and we had two bugs um, and I used yeah. to trace, you know, and draw it. it. There was no separation, you know. No, my first car, first car yeah. I ever bought, brand new. I did have, I had a used Acura Integra first, but once I got rid of that, I bought a brand new '97 Volkswagen Jetta. No separation. No, and and see, and to me, Volks is is people and wagon. So to me, that what that says to me is the our the people and our vehicle were separated. There's a disconnect here between the person and the vessel or the vehicle that it's using to get somewhere. You know, we can't move the people in the wagon if we're all divided. That's the, that was my interpretation of that when I really looked at it. And to me, that's very profound. So when he played No One Gets Left Behind, I thought, how in the hell is that possible? There's no way you're going to get all these people on the same page, you know? There's just no way. Everyone's so divided. and But I, I believe that there is some plan that is so ingenious and beyond anything that human beings could even comprehend that it is going to play out, that we're going to witness. And that when it's all over, it will have been worth it. That's what I think. I think that, that for us to become whatever being we're supposed to be, we have to go through something like this to, to grow, to, to become whatever that is we are supposed to become. That's what I feel. And, and so I, I have a lot of hope for the future. You know, I'm, I, I, I believe the ending is going to be a good one. But yeah, Volkswagen and, you know, so don't, no one gets left behind. I like that idea. You know, I don't want anybody to get left behind. That sucks. You know, um, how that could possibly happen, we'll see, you know. Um, but it's 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 really interesting. I would definitely recommend people start paying more close attention to your music that you hear around you, wherever you are. Yeah.
Let's take a let's take a five minute break and come right back, okay? Okay, and then, sounds um, good. We'll, we'll we'll come back for like the last segment. We'll start to wind it down a little bit, okay? But I got okay. a couple more questions to get into, okay? Okay, cool. All right, cool, guys. We'll be right back. Dose of reality, my awakening, episode forty nine. Nathan Sanders, Brian Stavely. We'll be right back. Skies outside are covered in goo. Smoking a big tube, watching the YouTube. It's time to go in now, but what can he do? Stanley's going live again in Centerville. Searching for truth. Taking some calls. Some people claim there's something wrong with his brain. Cause he knows we don't live on a ball. Chatting, ranting about the moon landing. Unity strikes and hate speech on YouTube. But he's such a cutie when he shakes his booty. He says, Neil the grass will not take the loop. Stately's live tonight, but not in Central Bill. No one even knows that's now what it's called. All of his subs know he's not gay or insane, but they know he's got something for Paul. Mandela affected, the facts are collected, plenty of proof that our memories are good. Stones and flip flops. McMahon and his two drops. It's a beautiful day now in this neighborhood. Stately streaming true tonight in Centerville. Karen B. Young, call her watching the chat. Some people play. We got it. Game, but we know still and it's flat. Mirror, but we can see clearer because everyone here knows that we're the fucking best. Stately's premiering videos in Centerville might be at work or even in bed. Sometimes he claims he's going. Live on the main, but he don't. He gets a late lead instead. Everyone now. He gets a late lead instead. All right, everyone. Welcome back to Dose of Reality. Before I even start, 
Um, I've seen some of you guys asking. Um, anytime I have a guest on, I mean, especially on an awakening interview, at least, um, his links are below. His links are in the show notes, and his links are also in the pinned comment. Nathan, are you back? I have to ask you yeah, a question. Yeah, I'm here. I mean, I'm going to tell people, obviously, to sub and bell your channel, but you would say you're way more active on Facebook, correct? So they should follow you on Facebook? Yeah, yeah. Send me a Facebook uh, friend request, and I'll add you. Yeah, because I post a lot of stuff there about okay. Mandela Effect. And just and I usually just ask a question just to see. And, and a lot of times it's the same question I asked last year on that day. The Facebook, you know, memories reminds me. And what I do is I see how the responses have changed in the last year. More and more people have gotten oh, yeah. the updates. You know, they've gotten the updates as time has gone by. Um, you know, it's it's almost a rewritten memory. You know, so you know, one thing I wanted to to ask you about your Centerville and Centralville. Yeah. Remember, and you there was the film where they had you felt they were mocking you. Yes, the Bill Murray film, uh, the Dead Don't Die. It's called. Okay. See, I've been thinking about this a lot as a creative person, you know, as a writer myself. And, you know, one theory is that this is all predictive programming, that they are putting these things into the movies and the books and the comics or whatever, you know, uh, to foreshadow what they plan to do, either because they feel they if they show us what they're going to do and we're, we're not smart enough to figure it out, then that's on us and they have no karma. You know, there's all these theories, which we don't know if that's true. But I have another idea. I am wondering if the creator is doing a lot of this revealing to us through creative people. So meaning yeah. that sometimes, you know, when I'm writing, something will come to me that I know did not come from me. It came from something else that put it into my mind to put down on the paper. And a lot of times these are magical moments that you that just capture an audience. So often I think that we might want to start considering that's a possibility too, that all that 911 stuff was put through the creative power, the creative consciousness to show us, to reveal the reality to us when we look back and saw it, that we yeah. recognized it, you know? Um, so the, what I'm saying is perhaps they chose the name of that, not because they were mocking you, but because something much more powerful, uh, than they were, had them do it to send you a message. So you would know that this, this intelligence knows that, you know, it's like a hello, Brian. Oh, yeah. I you see what I, I'm saying. Like a hi, Brian, yeah, I see you. But yeah. in a loving way, yeah, not not the not the enemy doing it. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. No, I definitely see what you're saying. I definitely, certainly don't think it's the writers of the movie or Hollywood giving orders to mock me. I do think it's of the higher. Now the question is: Is it the good side or the is bad it side? Malevolent, I, I, or is it malevolent? Yeah, yeah that's that's I, the. And I think we need to think about that. I think it's good and healthy for us to use our consciousness that way and try to discern. How else are we going to learn, yeah. you know, to be able to understand what these energies and essences are when you feel a negativity attached to something? We need to know that we've been cut off on our a lot of our intuition, you know, our just our inner knowing. So I think these are perhaps ways that we're being taught as well to come become better spiritual warriors, to be able to see the tricks and be able to discern when the and I'll tell you the music messages help me in that because what would happen is I would ask a question and I wouldn't get an answer that, you know, that was intelligent. Yeah. So I would realize, well, wait a minute, maybe I need to get myself in a better place. So I would meditate. I would take some time. I would really contemplate the question and then I would get the answer. There were other times where I would get a string of songs that did not feel good. They felt negative. And then I, I real, and it used to scare me at first because I thought, why are these negative songs coming now? But it had an energy signature attached to it that I learned very well, and I would recoil from it. And then I would power down my device again, the Pandora, come back up, and I would resume questions. And then I would feel a different presence now. The presence I would feel now felt light. It felt fun. It felt loving. It felt uh, playful. 
you know, and I, so I started to understand there's an energy attached to the messages. And is he trying to show me when he pulls back that energy, I'll know what's of him and what's of something else. I can recognize it, you know, Mm -hmm. um, because I wish I knew, I wish I had known the night I died and had the near death experience. I wish I had known then what I know now. I could have asked him so many questions, you know, but my, my understanding then was so limited, you know, I, I really wasted that opportunity. If I could only go back, I would know what to say now when I have it right there, you know, um, but, but maybe you aren't, you wouldn't have been ready for the answers to those questions yet at that point. No, I don't think so. And I think that's why I see an extraordinary respect because n- none of the changes are, 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 uh, hurt anyone. I mean, they're not, it's not, oh, that's what I say to people, except for the, know, these are harmless things we're talking about, you know, I know. And the people, the, the people that take the Bible one so personally, but still, it's still just words on the paper. I mean, the word of God is in your heart, isn't it? Well, you know, and I'm a writer. There's only one person that can change anything in my plays normally. And that's me. No one else has the authority to do it because I wrote it. So to me, yeah. who's ever changing the Bible, it's, it's his or hers. It's its book. You know, it could do what it wants, you know, if it wrote it. And a friend of mine asked me that question, you know, why would it do that to the Bible? And, and which feels like an attack almost. And I said, the only thing that came to me in that moment was I said, well, did you ever think that maybe this being that's doing the changes loves you more than the Bible? Mm-hmm. And it's in the way of it, of, of him connecting with you in a real way that needs to happen. Now you can't have a crutch. You got to go straight to the, the main guy, <laughs> you know, straight to the top beeline. So to me, that, that could be what's happening, but I also know it's being, it's almost as if it's a script because what is the book of revelation, but a script, you know, Brian, and billions of people expect those events to play out before we can go home. And I think that's a big issue. So I think we are going to probably see some of those things roll out, but not in the way we expect. Um, and then in a more of a, a interesting way. And maybe that that has to play out so people can consciousness can catch up with, oh, maybe we can go into a, a greater state now, a higher elevation of, of being, you know, that, that, that this is, it feels like whatever this is, is necessary. It has to happen for us to go where we have to go. Mm-hmm. So to me, it's, um, you know, every day it's, I, I, I ask every morning I wake up, I ask for a sign. I say, please, Sam, talk to me. Let me know you're there. And every day I get one. It will be like, Brian, I'll ask a song. I'll, I'll be on my way to a meeting and I'll say, OK, I need a I need a you know, do you have some I'll ask either. Um, what do I need to know? That's the big question I always ask. And then I see what song plays and then I contemplate that throughout the day. And it's amazing the synchronicities that will come in the physical reality and confirm the song. So one time I did it and it played a song called uh, Natalie. And I get to my meeting and I'm introduced to a new person that's going to be there that I, I didn't know. And her name is Natalie. I'd never met her before in my life. That's so, true. Yeah. Crazy. So that's why I'm really suggesting strongly that if you've never used music as a way to sort of receive higher messages, try, try it and see what happens. You know, I can't promise anything. It's not a perfect science. A lot of it's your own interpretation, which is why I don't share messages anymore because, you know, that's my interpretation and I don't want to lead somebody down the wrong road, you know, but for me, that's how I do it. That's how I keep centered. And I keep, so sometimes, you know, one time I was in a really dangerous situation that I had to get out of physically in danger. And I wasn't sure how to extricate myself from this individual who was quite dangerous. And I asked the question on Pandora's shuffle and the song that played was run away. So I got my stuff in the car and I left immediately. I could have saved my life. You know, and I had so I I look for the guidance because I don't know what's going on here. I just know this is very strange what we're all witnessing, (laughs) you know, that we're a part of. Yeah, (laughs) 
<laughs> I mean, it is. I think I have to keep pinching myself that this is real. That's why sometimes I feel like I'm in a movie or a play. Yeah, I mean, I'm at the point where I, I, I think I cope with it pretty well. I mentally handle it pretty well. It doesn't really the, the changes isn't what phases me too much. You know, you know what phases me is is too. It's it's these people they don't see it. So that's hard, Nathan. Is really a bringing intellectual down to talk to other people, and and that sounds thing to people, but it's hard to go out every day and pretend that I'm stupid, and you almost have to pretend that you're stupid to fit in. You do have to pretend that you're stupid to fit in. You know what yeah. I mean? Oh yeah, I have very hard time with small talk. I don't know how to do it anymore. You know, I went to this barbecue, and I rarely go to social things, but I went to this barbecue on Sunday, and uh, you know, and they put on. And I didn't know really, you know, I can do the small talk for a while, but then thank God at some point near the end of the party, they put on Looney Tunes on Netflix or whatever. <laughs> and so, I, of course, there's my chance, you know, and I was real calm about it. And I asked them what they remember. They every all 10 of those guys remember T-O-O-N-S, all of them. And they were all my age or a little older. So and so when I told them, of course, the first thing is. Oh, well, they changed it or you're just looking at, the, you know, that whole thing. Um, but out of the 10 people, only one. And I showed them uh, Scarecrow's gun. Of course, they said that was Photoshopped. You know, and as much as you say, no, this is it. They, they just can't conceive of what you're telling them. Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, I shared that with them as well. Um, I always like, oh, and Mirror Mirror on the Wall. That is, that's the one I forgot. That's my biggest one that I tell people. Dude, that's home run, dude. Everybody yeah, knows that's mirror, the mirror. home run. If, if I were me. anybody else, I would always start with mirror, mirror. If you're confused about what to first mention, because you got to sometimes hook them with that very first one. You won't get a second chance because they've already shut down. Yeah. And whatever that is in their brain, if it's a parasite or whatever, it already has got danger. Will Robinson shut this down. You know, did you see Westworld, the series on HBO, Brian? No, I, I know what it is, but I never watched it. Um. I I don't have a TV. I very rarely watch anything, but I did get some feelings that I needed to watch it. And what's fascinating about it, these are basically, you know, robots who become start to become conscious. They start to question their existence. And what the way they're programmed is um, anytime someone comes to them with any any information or anything that will make them question the reality, they're programmed to respond with the following. They say, doesn't look like anything to me. And they walk away. So the father, it's out in the West time, and he has his daughter, the, you know, the two of them alone on this ranch. And she he finds a picture in the dirt of a woman at Times Square with cars around her. And he's mm -hmm. very confused. And he comes home and he's sitting on the porch and his beautiful daughter comes home and she says, what's wrong, daddy? And he says, look at this. And she looks at it and she says, doesn't look like anything to me. So she can't see it, but he can. So yeah. it's a fascinating allegory about what I think we're dealing with, with these friends and family that cannot see it. It's almost like it's there's either something it's either the something not allowing them to see it because it, they're not ready or it's not their time or something sinister yeah. lo uh, keeping gotta them be, from seeing it's it. Gotta be, it's got to be they're not ready and maybe, you know, God is putting a little bit of a filter on what we can show them or something because they're just not ready. Because the fucking – sorry, here's the hard part because we talk about this a lot. Like oh, people say, so these people, they don't see the chemtrails. They don't see this. They don't see that. And a lot of people say they just literally can't physically see it, right? right. But with this, we know, we know that when we test them on these things, they do have the same memories as us. So it's like a different dynamic here. It's like affected. But that denial, do you think that's a protection switch from the because they can't mentally – I think I think both are very possible. Which one it is, I'm not sure. But I think we need to keep collecting data, keep observing, keep. To me, that's the fascinating thing is is not the changes, but the people's reaction to that, and yeah. and, and and what you can learn from watching them. It's very powerful. Some people call it the wheat and the tares parable, where there was, you know, some people are likening it to that. Um, 
but the but there's something that is happening there and once that's what proved to me between that and the disinformation that was happening and the ridicule yeah. i knew immediately this is real and they're terrified of this this is something they have absolutely no control over and every yeah. time a change happens they've been ingenious in their ways to cover it and to rewrite the collective memory so no one ever questions yeah. it and yeah, they're and all you together in it you know yeah, you can you can see the way they try and gatekeep it. They can't stop it, but as soon as a change happens, they'll come out with something to try and reinforce the reinforce then, the reality and, to make you yeah. question the truth. And then they'll belittle you, ridicule you, mock you, degrade you, do whatever they can do to convince you your reality did not change. Let me tell you something. If the people that I know who really don't believe in this or aren't into it or just don't even want to think about it, they're not in chat rooms or commenting on Facebook Mandela effect group, debunking this continually. Mm -hmm. These are not real people that are doing that. These are either agents of the system or they are overtaken by some other consciousness that's, that's doing some dirty work. So, you know, and I call them people of the lie. You know, these are the pottles, the pottle people. I don't even want to, <laughs> I don't even want to call them controllers or rulers because it gives them too much power. But yeah, I, I call them the pottles, the pottles, the people of the lie. And I think in the end, Brian, it's going to be, are we going to stand? Are we going to be people of the truth or people of the lie? And I think that's the spiritual battle. It's the lie. And I have a feeling that the reason we're in this situation stems from some lie that was told at some point that had great repercussions. So... Mm -hmm. That's why I think truth is so important to us. It's more important to us than family being shunned from my by our friends. Is. Yeah. It is the that to that need for the truth. So that is coming from some ancient place that we cannot live in this lie. And then when we get honest oh, with ourselves, do. and that's what I'm wondering too, Brian. Like, do do people are I mean, are we how do I put this? Um, are, are, are we seeing things as staged, not because they're actually staged, but because that's what we're being shown now so we can detach from this reality? Is it a way to pull us out without trauma? Uh, I think about that sometimes. To pull us out without trauma, but then you think about Sandy Hook, 9-11. I mean, that's a lot of trauma. No, I mean, the fact that we can see it for what it was. Yeah. They're still, the masses are still having to experience that as trauma, which is interesting. They're still being traumatized by that where we're not. Why? Why are we being protected where they can't see it yet and they're still suffering over that, that imagined trauma? that was put on them. You know what I mean? I mean, these are the deep places yeah. you can go with this. That's why the sky's the limit. You know, it may start out with Mickey Mouse's suspenders are gone now, but th it goes to a very deep place. And I'll, I, I did want to bring up this because it's something I really don't, I, I talked about it once on um, the mission accomplished podcast, but I, I started thinking about like the wizard of Oz change when Glenda now says to Dorothy, uh, yeah. Tap your heels three times and say there's no place like home. Yeah. That actress was named Billy Burke. She was a Ziegfeld Follies girl back in the day. And um she died, I think, in 1969, 1970. So she's been dead a long time. So here we see her with a completely different line. You know, she's saying a completely different word. How is that possible if she's dead? You know, I started thinking about the actress herself. And the yeah. more I thought about this, I started think I started getting a lot of messages about rebirth and res or mainly resurrection. And I thought, are we through some of these changes where these people who have already died um, are now record having different lines in their movies than we remember? And even those who were dead who now are back now. The, for me, it's Billy Graham. I saw his funeral on television after 2011 in, in Atlanta. Presidents came, the ex-presidents were there. That was a huge one for me. I don't have any of the others, but he, that's one for me, Billy Graham, was dead and then came alive again. 
So I thought to myself, are we being given a preview of the resurrection of the dead? That whatever power this is that can resurrect them to redo their lines could certainly bring them back to life completely. Yeah. And is that how we're being prepared for that may be a potential at some point where we're going to see that our loved ones yeah. back or some reunion with them or in another realm or what, you know what I'm saying? Just to sort of. Yeah. I get so, you get you warmed up for it where it's just, it's celebrities and, and whatnot. It, it, it's a big deal, but it's not like your loved ones, but as you get used to this type of thing, even being possible, it's kind of warming your, uh, you up to that idea. Right. Yeah. I had a dream where my, and, and this is why I was thinking about it. Cause the other night I had a dream where there was a knock at the door and I answered it and it was my mother and she was alive. And that was the only thing. And then I woke up, but looking at her face and seeing that she was alive, something hit me. And I thought, Oh my God, is that really what's going on here? Are we being prepared for something like that to happen? Otherwise you're, you're completely, you, you know, the, the, they would, people would snap their collective pickle, you know I mean? They would go insane. They couldn't handle that. Yeah. So perhaps we are being brought step by step through this process because I have to say, I've, I've wondered if I survived that 2013 near death. I, I, a lot of times I don't think I did that, well, you know, that there's a lot physically I didn't yeah. die, but something in me did. You know, something in me changed. There's a lot of people in the Mandela community, as you know, that that correlate the Mandela effect to near-death experience. Maybe that's the cause of the Mandela. And I don't think, because for me personally, I don't believe I had that experience. So I will say for me, it's not the cause, but I believe the Mandela effect has always been going on. And it's when we kind of tune into it. And certainly if you have a near-death experience, that could give your spirituality a kick in the ass because you already got one foot out the door, right? Right, right, exactly. No, and I, and I did feel, you know, when I got back, you know, it was very difficult. I went through a deep depression for about six months after the near-death experience. I could not be here anymore. The, the difference in the energy, how dense this, this, this realm feels, how heavy, it is very, very difficult once you've, been, you've, you've ha had a taste of being free from it and, and what that feeling feels like, that, that joy and ecstasy and, and beauty and safety and love, you just cannot describe it. So to go from that and be plunged back in this thing was very, very difficult. And I tell you, I, I thought of suicide. I really did. It got really bad. But I, wow. I knew that I had to stay alive. I had to fight whatever this darkness was. And I had to overcome this. And I had to be, and I had to be, you know, use my imagination and, 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 and really put the pieces together. So, so, you know, these, you know, I don't understand people who have these might have, you know, I heard about near death experiences that, you know, were so positive and mine was beautiful while it was happening, but then very difficult later, you know, um, because yeah. there was a period of time where I didn't have contact with him. I couldn't get messages. I couldn't, you know, um, and it took me a while to sort of connect again. And that was through the music. You know, I was able to connect through the music and then, then start feeling these these, uh, you know, being the synchronicities. <clears throat> how is this? Um, how has this affected the people close to you, like your immediate family, and maybe a not so immediate family, and and your close friends that you've had for a long part of your life? Well, it's been really difficult because, um, you know, after the near death experience, when I did share it with people, it sounds crazy, you know. So I think a lot of them thought I'd had some sort of psychotic break. I think it changed the way they felt about me a lot. Um, one thing it did um, for me as I lost all interest in writing and doing anything fictional, I just wanted to know the truth. So that sent me on that, you know, that journey yeah. and then finding the things it was. But once I started sharing about, you know, events that are staged and that kind of thing, I could really tell I was being looked at as a nutcase. You know, OK, here's the tinfoil hat guy. This is what's happened to him. This is so sad. 
you know, meanwhile, you know, some of these people know, you know, I'm a really good writer. So I'm obviously an intelligent person. So if I'm seeing yeah. something and saying, look, there's something here you need to look at, you would think they would at least look, <laughs> you know, that's what's so crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a raving no, lunatic that's, off the street. <laughs> that's what bothers me. And it's like people that I grew up with, they all considered to me to be one of the their smartest friends. And then as we go on these journeys through these different topics, they see me decipher 9-11 and then NASA and all these other things. And it's like they won't even give me the time of day to look into the Mandela effect. It's like, well, if you think I'm spot on about X, Y, and Z, it's like you don't have to believe me. I don't want you to believe me, but can you at least look like give it an honest look? Like I don't know. I'm not asking you to put a month in, just give it a look for a night for me An honest, put an honest night in and try and debunk it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And you know, what's interesting. I, I have had a couple of people, uh, uh, both were women that I talked to recently about the Mandela effect and they have my favorite reaction goosebumps. There are those when you tell them, I'm sure you've had it, who say, oh, I'm getting goosebumps. Have you had that happen yet? Um, yeah, I think I have. Oh, yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So when that's their first reaction, I know I've got a live one now. This is, yeah. this is, this is one that's one of us. I can tell right away because they're first, it was like me, the first reaction, you know, when that happens, boy, you're really, you've got someone that's probably going to research this and, and open their eyes. And I can usually tell pretty quickly now, um, you know, when I talk to people about it, uh, that that's why, you know, and I understand your impatience with people that call in and don't see it and want to debunk it. I, I can't deal with that. We got to move. We got to move forward. We know this is real. We can't waste any time with these people trying to prove to them something they are never going to be able to see. So that I understand that. It's not like you know. to prove it to them anymore. It's just like yeah. you know, anything. We have to progress and there's plenty of new people coming and they can deal with those people. I can't waste my time yeah. with that. Uh, you know what I mean? No. We're on a different level. Uh, you know, not because so you know what? While you're and I think it's a tactic because while you're distracted having to deal with this this uh, blind person that can't see anything. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, you're, you're, you're like at the Helen Keller Institute and this one's trying to tell you where everything is, you know, they're blind. They can't see, but they want to debate with you. So while they're debating with you, you're not focusing and being conscious of where you really should be, you know? So I think yeah. they're distracting us when they do that, taking our focus off the, the communication that's happening, you know, with this higher realm or this, this greater consciousness, so it's a constant thing of pull us back down into this lower frequency where everyone's fighting and at each other's throats and divided. And it's really ugly. You know, it's really, really ugly. I have to struggle a little bit not to let my, uh, you know, not to let my feelings get hurt, like with friends that, you know, I, I had this friend who sent me the text about the criminal minds and she said, you know, that's on. And I said, thank you. And then once I saw it, I realized, OK, now this is what she's going to think of me and what I what I am experiencing. And uh, the next time I had a message from her Facebook, the last thing she wrote was um, there is no magic. You know, so we're magical thinkers, we're deluded magical thinkers, and we better get back into politics and voting and doing all of this that they need us to do because evil is coming and we have to overturn the evil. It's insanity. These people are nuts. They're lunatics and they think we're the crazy ones. <laughs> this is like a 5150 planet. It's like a planet for the criminally insane. <laughs> These people. <laughs> You know, it really is. It is like a quarantine place. I don't know, you know, but they're, they're, they're nuts, you know, um, and, and they don't see the way they're being mocked. They don't see that, you know, they, they don't see any of it. So that's I why I, say, I, I really yeah. do. I mean, I feel bad for them. I mean, look at the stuff that NASA passes off as footage that people accept. Oh, it's like, man, the stories that they put out, it's like, you know, and, and I don't, I don't know exactly. I, I don't know even know close to where we are, what this place is. But it certainly would be in mistold, misrepresented, and the stuff that's put out, it's so insulting. I mean, they just give you cartoons and shit, and it's like people buy it up. People think Elon Musk has a convertible in outer space with a mannequin driving. <laughs> I know. David Bowie. It's insanity, <laughs> and they think we're the ones that are crazy. Wow, what a lopsided reality this is, huh? 
Oh, that's what I'm saying. If you can, if you can get out of here with your sanity still intact, boy, you are one, you're one hell of a guy or gal, because this, this place is, this is top. I mean, f fuckery. There's no fuckery like this place. I mean, they've got every trick in the book. Um, and it's, 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 it's incredible. You can tell these are people who have spent an enormous amount of time studying the human mind and the way we think in order to manipulate, you know, it's like, I don't, I don't know. You see the national anthem where, uh, uh, that they used to show on the sign off on the sixties and seventies on TV, where it's embedded with all the, the, uh, the messages, the subliminal messages along the, the, uh, the print across the screen. You know, when you see they were doing that in the sixties, you know, saying obey government, government is God. These kind of messages were embedded. I mean, that's working real hard to go into our subconscious when we're in that beta state getting ready to fall asleep. They are, they, they must be very weak in their own innate power to have to resort to tricks like this. You know, it's like they're, they're spell casters. You know, that's really what they're oh, like. They're yeah. like dark magicians entrancing and enchanting the people. Yeah, I was saying just earlier today, I was saying Neil deGrasse Tyson, look at this guy. He's a fucking wizard. That's what they are, dude. They are spell casting. Yeah, but they need you to think. I think what they're doing with the simulation that we're in a computer is if they don't know if a big change is coming, if a big radical change comes, they're going to have to say something to the people. So I think the simulation, they're laying that as a plan B. If something great happens, then they can quickly trot out all these scientists that can explain exactly. how we're in a computer and that we don't understand how it works, but that's what it is. And some human maybe from the future created it. They will say everything except this is God. Yeah, that's exactly the direction. That's exactly why they did the Mandela Effect movie the way they did Yeah. What they do is they put just a couple of the surface changes in there. They do never, they never, ever, ever explain residue because that's physical proof that we have to back up our memories that they can't just say is a bunch of people confabulating something. But they never, ever address residue. And then what they do is so they don't make it so it's so convincing. It's going to convince you the Mandela effect is real. But if you if you are leaning that way and you go see it, they are prepared to throw you down that simulation rabbit trail. That's exactly what they do. Yeah. They bait you in and then they throw you down that. Because again, oh, yeah. the way I look at it is that takes away your soul. That takes away your consciousness, your current your connection to the creator. And if you're in a simulation, I mean, you're, you're pretty insignificant, dude. And that's why I feel the parallel universe's ideas thrown out right in the, right in the beginning of that criminal minds episode, they go right to parallel before she even brought up Mandela, mm -hmm. the scene before, she started going into parallel universe theories out of nowhere, dude. Like, it came out of left field. It didn't even make sense in the story. Yeah, no, it made no sense at all. No, you know, you you are, my feeling is from all the research I've done and the data I've collected and my intuition and questions I've asked Sam and and just, just all of that, that we are in a single reality that is being altered by an outside force that is outside this reality. It is greater than our reality. We're a bubble in something. And this being is attempting to, I keep hearing the, the, the phrase soul retrieval to retrieve lost. And, and I get a lot of like lost at sea song messages, the sense that we're, we're lost somewhere and someone's trying to find us and bring us home finding Dory, you know, and that all the fear against this being that we've been indoctrinated with to fear God, to do this, that he's, he's destructive and warlike and wants sacrifice all of that, that they all have said is to make us afraid. So we can't trust it when it comes and shows its face and communicates directly. We will push it away in fear. Because we've been told, well, if you know someone's coming to break out the prisoners at some point, you don't know when, but you know, eventually they're going to get there. You're going to have to set the stage. So when that person finally shows up, they're all going to fear that, you know, or that idea or that phenomenon or whatever it is that shows up. And in our case, it's been this, you know, it's, it's, it's these changes. So um, to me, it is a, it's an incredible battle of consciousness here. And, 
and I think I think the more detached we can stand from the emotion of it, the better off we'll be. You know, I, I try not to let it harvest my energy, but it's very difficult, especially when you've got a show, you know, and you're getting all the the attacks and the trolls and the accusation. It gets so. I mean, it is so evil. I mean, you, you oh, you're getting yeah. a glimpse of, of what we're dealing with here. You know that these tactics are used. <laughs> Look at some of the disgusting shit they say about people. Like, really? You're going to call people child molesters and all that? Like, I don't know, man, where I come from. Or what the split? You know, you say that to somebody in person. I mean, you're going to get hit with something over the fucking head. Like, you don't say that. That's just going yeah. to another level, dude. That's just vile and disgusting shit. And, and, oh, yeah. and the way that they will, uh, these people will attack women. I mean, it's like such a cowardly act. They have to be driven by a demonic force, in my opinion, to act like that. I, I do believe there are. Uh, many, many regular people that are just trolls and they're mindless and they follow certain, you know, the people that are causing division. But a lot of those people mm -hmm. causing division, there's something behind that force uh, making them do that, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we're seeing a lot of evidence of people just freaking out, you know, Brian. It's like they're just losing their shit in traffic. Uh, I mean, the Popeye's chicken sandwich, somebody got stabbed over one of those and killed. I mean, people are killing people over Popeye's chicken sandwiches. There's something seriously wrong here, you know. So, so th th there is no doubt in my mind that this is this is a battle, you know. And 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 but we're if we're going to win, we have to be very smart and know that it's in our mind. It's 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 you know what, what was it? Um, you know, Jesus said, "The truth shall make shall uh, make you free." It changed from set to make. Mm -hmm. That's the Mandela effect. I think that's important. I think the truth is what I makes didn't it even free. know about that one. The oh, truth yeah. shall make you free. Change to the truth shall make you free. Yes. <laughs> I didn't even know that one, dude. Yeah. That's it. That's, that's King James. Point. Unless it's changed back, I, I, someone can maybe check just to make sure the King James version says it says make. Um, so. So we, we, we uh, but I think it's spiritual warriorship here. I think that's, this is the Jedi Knight training, you know, you're talking about. Um, and it's normal. It's average people, just your everyday people that, that, because you know what I wonder too, where, you know, where are all the, well, what's interesting, there's no billionaire step forward yet that sees this and is helping us and giving us channels and, and serious radio streams. I mean, where's that person? I mean, there's a lot of billionaires in the I world. Mean, I mean, there's not there's not wanna, one that sees that sees the Mandela effect wanna, that's going to help us out. <laughs> you want to talk about people that are so tied into the system? The more money you give people, the more tied in and brainwashed they become. It's really yeah. hard. Yeah, what the, the absence of someone like that, even a multimillionaire, the absence of someone like that to to see the Mandela effect and speak out publicly and assist us in getting the message out. And to really educate the public about what's really going on without fear or ridicule or, you know, this kind of stuff. That person hasn't shown up because that person doesn't exist. It shows you what kind yeah. of battle we're in. Yeah. You know, I, I asked Sam, what is Earth? This was one of the questions I asked. And he played the song Shabalba, which was from the movie The Fountain, which was a Hugh Jackman film. And Shabalba, it means place of fear. It's the it's the Mayan underworld is what Shababa is. So I got the sense this is a lower realm of consciousness underneath something that's actually real. And and somehow we were in this experience and yet we're now being shown that it's not what we thought it was, that there's something fake and pernicious about it, that it's not a benevolent uh, place um, and that we're in some kind of bondage here. And we have to we have to get smart and wake up and free and free the hostages is sort of the way I, I look at it, you know, and I think that's what we're doing. So w why do they need us here? Are we a source of energy? Are we um, are we what projects the reality because we're the creator beings and without us, they don't even have a realm, you know. It's I, you know, I, th I think these are all questions that we can start to ponder, you know, think really deep, put on your Sherlock Holmes hat and really and really think of this like a detective. This is a great mystery we can solve, you know, 
um, if we're not divided, which of course, then they come in and they divide the community, you know how they do, you know, <clears throat> because they don't want us putting our heads together and they certainly don't want us on the same page. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh. I agree. Um, so why did you, um, decide to come out and do this interview today and just kind of put it all out here? Well, you know, I had asked, um, when the criminal minds happened, you know, for the first time in a year and a half, I really felt like I wanted to make a video about it, a talk about that episode. And, um, so I asked Sam, I did a Pandora shuffle and I said, you know, do you want me to make a, a new video? And, uh, the song that played was someday soon. So that was a few days ago. So when you sent me the message to, and I really wanted to call in because I really like what you're doing and what you're saying. And I just, I can't tell you how much I enjoy listening and what it does to help me feel like I have a community. I'm not alone here, you know? And so I wanted to, to sort of participate and connect and talk to you personally and also Karen. Um, so I called in a couple times. And then when you sent me the message today, um, you know, I, I asked Sam, I said, you know, do you want me to, is it okay if I go on the show? Is that what, what's the best thing for, you know, whatever the plan is here that we've got going um, to hopefully help everybody. And he played Put On Your Boogie Shoes by Casey and the Sunshine Band. And that's the song I always get when it's an affirmative, yes, take this action, go forward and do this. So when I got that, you know, and then the next, and I said, well, why do you want me to, to do it? And the next song that played was Got A Feeling. It's going to be a good night. So I felt like he was saying, yeah, you know. Um, and then the next song he played was Say My Name. He was saying, make sure you say the name Sam and tell them, you know, who I am. So that's that's why I wanted to come on. Once I got the clearance and I sent back and said, okay, I'll do it. But, you know, I, 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 I got sick of the trolls and the attacks and the stalkers and the death threats and the evil stuff coming in. And I was always answering all the comments and trying to answer emails. It just got so heavy and dark and people that that thought that i had the answer personally or that i was you know where i'm just sort of trying to deliver the message i felt a deep responsibility i didn't want to make a mistake and maybe put out the wrong message which would send someone down the wrong path so i just i just asked sam you know what do i do here and he played take five the old jazz number and i thought okay i'm gonna take a break and it's and every few months i will ask and i get a no you know, don't come back, just, just, you know, take five. And, um, and so then it seemed like for whatever reason, I was supposed to talk on this tonight. Um, and as an update to tell people, you know, I'm still here. I'm doing okay. I didn't, you know, get abducted <laughs> by aliens or anything. Well, I just I mean, need it's been a really, it's been a really good conversation for everybody. Everybody's really enjoyed it. Cause me and you can kind of have a little deeper conversation than, you know, me just coming out here and taking, you know, just taking random calls or whatever. I think it's been really good. Um, <clears throat> I am going to wind it down. I, I do sure. have to I have to crash. Yeah. But before I do, we're just going to let everybody know that in the links, in the comment below and in the um, show notes are all your links. And you do have a – we told everybody about your uh, Facebook page and your YouTube, and you also have a Facebook group. What's that about? Yeah, it's called uh, – it's, it's, it's called Angels Ascending, and the link is there too. And that's, that's where I documented a lot of the song messages. I posted them there, the screenshots, the questions I asked. And I also shared synchronicities and things like that um, about Sam and what his message was and what his solution was to our dilemma with an MN. I remember MN. So, um, so that's all there, but I do want to just say, you know, those are the, you know, it's not a perfect science. If you, if you look at the messages or, or play Shane's series that I did with him, you'll hear a lot of the song messages and, and some of it's, a lot of it's controversial, but you know, you have to follow your own path. And, um, you know, maybe one day years from now, it'll be more obvious why that was important for me to put them there. But I did feel like I had to share them for whatever it was worth, that maybe it might be of use one day. You know, we're trying to figure this out and piece it together. And so whatever information we get, I feel we have to share as honestly as we can and then let each person make their decision go the way they need to go. So I'm just saying that as sort of a you know disclaimer, those are the songs that came to me in those meditative states with this pandora or you know shuffle thing and and that's you can see what you know and and hopefully i got it right you know on some of it but it can be left to interpretation too you know each person can interpret you may see something completely different in the message that i got you know and that's okay too so 
uh, we'll, hopefully we'll, we'll figure all this out at some point. That's my, my, my hope. Yeah. Well, dude, thank you. It's been an awesome night. Thank and, you, Brian. Uh, will, you come back, will you come back on sometime maybe with me and Karen just to talk about whatever? Sure. I'd love to. And you know what? It's two twenty-two right now, Eastern standard time, two, two, two. So for my wow. friend, my friend, Anthony's always seeing two, two, two. So that's for, that's for Anthony and the other, other people that that means something to. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Brian. It was great talking to you. All right, brother. So everybody make sure you sub and bell his channel. Make sure you follow his Facebook profile and his page. They're all linked below. And uh, I'm going to be out of here. This is episode 49 of the My Awakening series with Nathan Sanders, interviewed by myself, Brian Stavely. And I will be back. What is already going to be tonight because it's already into Thursday now. So me and Karen have our show Thursday night uh, right back on this channel. So I'll see you guys in I don't know, 16, 17, 18 hours. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody.